Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the School District of Waukesha Board of Education full board meeting. This is Wednesday, January 11th. Please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for those who chose to stand. Sue, would you please take the roll call? Mark Borowski? Here. Corey Montillo? Here. Kerry Kozlowski? Here. Markel Moore? Here. Joseph Como? Here. Patrick McCaffrey? Here. Anthony Zenobia? Here. Karen Robertson? Kelly Piasek? Here. Mrs. Robertson is excused tonight. Um, Sue, can you please verify that the meeting has been properly posted? Yes, it has. Thank you. You're welcome. We are very pleased tonight to celebrate um, the great success of our Waukesha South Band. And um, Dr. Siebert, did you want to share the news with the folks here tonight about what they've been up to? Oh, I would be happy to, Dr. Thank you. Piasek. Thank you. So our Waukesha South Band was selected by the governor's office to perform at the inauguration uh, of Governor Evers last week. And today we are very fortunate to be able to have the drum line from the Waukesha South Marching Band here with us. So, welcome South. Well done, thank you. I think we're going to start all of our board meetings like this from now on. This is a great, great. I'm awake, uh, ready to go. Woohoo! <laughs> We've got a long meeting ahead of us. Um, thank you all for being here. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Uh, I'm Chuck. I'm a sophomore at South, and I play tenors in the drum line. Um, I'm Jay. I'm also a sophomore, and I play snare. Um, I'm Taya. I'm a senior. Um, I play snare too. I'm Philip. I'm a senior, and I play bass. Welcome to all of you. We were all really excited to hear the news about you being invited to the inauguration. Um, what thoughts, questions, or comments do anybody have? Does anybody and have? We have Mr. Schreier. Oh, of course. Right, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Please. Well, <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you so much for inviting the drum line to play. Uh, pretty awesome. How awesome was that? Yes. Uh, it was great. Yeah. Uh, this group, along with the rest of the band, were tremendous representatives, as always, of South High School up at the state capitol. Uh, just a couple of acknowledgments outside of the band. They, the group has an average GPA of a 3.7. Um, they have a wide variety of commitments outside of band, including AVID, Engineering Academy, Tennis, Dance, the Musical, just to name a few. So they're very dedicated to South and our community in general. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to Michael De Bruin, our band director. Uh, we have had both the wonderful opportunity and the huge challenge of having three band directors in three years and arguably the most challenging time in our, our band's life. Uh, and Michael De Bruin has been nothing but fantastic for our kids and our families and our community. Um, 
I also want to shout out, there's a couple of, of band boosters here. Our band boosters do an incredible amount of work for our school and community. Um, there are a few here today. Just one small example of their dedication. Um, for the, the Cookie Walk, which is an annual Waukesha South tradition, um, many spent hours and hours, including being there until 1 a.m., after 1 a.m., uh, the day before the cookie walk setting up and preparing. Um, they raised $8,000 for the Parade Memorial Fund. So just a tremendous uh, group of kids, students, uh, teachers, and, and parent support all around. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you for all the administrative support for the band as well. Um, the reception during the Christmas Parade I think was fantastic. I think the community was really just um, uh, inspired to see all of you there and I know that took a lot of courage by all of you and your leaders um, so I'm just really grateful that you made the time to be here with us tonight and get us off to a good start so um, Mr. Como yeah I, uh, I just wanted to know what are the things what are the takeaways some of you've been in band a couple of years some of you fourth years what are some of the takeaways that you've have been in band, the things that you've learned? Um, I really think the community is like that and like the family that we've built um, is just the biggest thing because I mean you have classes with them outside of band and multiple band classes and you really just get familiar with everyone and you're able to grow like a little second family um, inside school. Any other thoughts? I mean I learned how to keep a beat. <laughs> hmm. uh, what I learned is that doing band, like a lot of people like do it because they either like want to do the activities and, st and stuff, but what I figured out it's actually more fun to do it just for like giggles than the activities that you get to do because um, if you do band for like four or three years or however many, however many years you want to, it just it brings a lot of maturity to it because in the beginning you may not be able to like hold the beat that Chuck's at and it can really help you sort of build off of sort of life and sort of help you with maturity, maturity that you need for like future life. I appreciate you guys sharing your, your thoughts and um, I really enjoyed, enjoyed uh, your performance. Mr. Montijo. Thank you. Uh, I happened to be watching the news the night of the night of the inauguration. I saw you all on TV, and even I think before they mentioned it was South. Hey, okay, that's South. Uh, when you do things like that, you not only get to experience a wonderful event, you get to show off your own talents. You, you represent the district. Um, I heard nothing but wonderful things about the performance, how you behaved. Um, you are a shining example of what we hope for in our students and what we hope to produce as human beings. Um, I was speaking with someone tonight about uh, dance, uh, girls that are in dance, and the lessons they learn about uh, being uh, in dance and teaching dance. And then it, we're reflecting it throughout the discussion about the things we did. I'm old now, so I reflect on things I did in high school. <laughs> Pretty old. Uh, and the stories we tell, though, are not the stories about that particular performance. It's about the people we met, the experiences we had. I don't remember the scores of any of my games. Um, the great thing about being in band is you have a skill you can take with the rest of your life. And you can play the drums till you're 75. I can't throw a baseball anymore. And I don't have, you know, 15 people to start a game with. So congratulations. And more importantly, thank you for representing our district and yourself so well. So great job. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is um, uh, our recognition, Dr. Siebert. All right, so this could have been a communication or a recognition, but I, I think because it's very special, it is our own Mr. Kyle Lemieux, our Associate Principal and Athletic Director at Waukesha West. He's been recognized by the National Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association, which is the NIAAA, as a certified Master Athletic Administrator. 
Uh, so to earn this distinction, Mr. Lemieux demonstrated exemplary knowledge, contributions, and ongoing professional development in the field of interscholastic athletic administration. Uh, the voluntary certification process included a thorough evaluation of his educational background, uh, experiences, the leadership courses he's taken, and professional contributions, and it culminated with a practical oral presentation project. So this puts Mr. Lemieux in a very elite group of athletic administrators nationwide. So we can all be very proud of Mr. Kyle Lemieux. That's great news. A uh, round of applause for Kyle. That's All right, thank you. Now moving on, we are um, at a report for, um, report by our student representatives. Tonight we have East High School student representative Max is with us to fill us in on activities and events at East. Welcome. Hello. I just gotta wait for the slack. Waiting for your AV team. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Max Sipo and I am a junior at Waukesha East. I started last spring and I feel I am able to tell you how East has changed from a mini traditional high school to a project based learning community. Actually. At East we no longer learn academic in, academics in silos where we, each subject stands alone. Every day we have a three hour seminar in the morning where we uh, strive to answer driving questions. You may, ask, you may ask why that's important, so let me explain. Driving questions make learning relevant because they are open-ended, because they have several possible answers or outcomes, and honestly, we can't just Google the answer. That's what's really cool. What, what's really cool is that the driving questions allow us to expand our learning because they tend to create even more questions. Oh. Another thing about project-based learning is it's all core. Academics are blended together, mastery learning targets or MLTs in English, science, and social studies are incorpor incorporated into <coughs> our various themes or projects with a final product that gives evidence of our learning. Evidence varies, it may be an essay, a podcast, a blog, or an experiment with data or even tangible product or even a tangible product. The sky's the limit with with ways we can show our learning. What's awesome about East is how we have six interactive workshops throughout the school day that gives us creative spaces to explore our talents and expand our learning. They are Artists Loft, which is our future fine arts studio, Photo Factory uh, is our photography and video making studio, Legends Laboratory is our science lab, Tinker's Tank is our maker space, uh, Firebird Studios is our recording studio and our programming lab. Fix It Kitchen is our culinary workshop. Our afternoons are a time where we can explore our hidden talents and pursue our interests. After lunch, we get to break up into our chosen workshops, and these workshops last for two hours a day. The workshops students get to choose from in a semester include Creation Station, which is photography, painting, jewelry, making candles, candle making, and knit knitting, which are only a few things that you can do. Uh, culinary Cultivations, which is making food and testing new like food experiments. Uh, growing in Service. It's science-based, and it looks at ways we can better our community. 
Outdoor Adventures. This is the one I'm in. It's, it's my favorite, and I've only done this one, so, yeah. It's basically like our gym. We get, like, yesterday or two days ago, we went to a, in, an escape room. We also went to a baseball game, and one other thing that I've just been blanking on. At East, we focus on next, in our next steps in life. We learn about college prep, manufacturing, apprenticeships, and trades. Every fall, we have a manufacturing fair where our local corporations will come and tell you what they do and how they do it. So, at the, we also visit WTCT, which is obviously, as you know, the technical school in Waukesha. We went to the hydraulics lab, the mechanical lab, and the automotive lab. Upper, as upperclassmen, we also have an opportunity to apply this, to apply for the Start College Now <coughs> program. What? College Now program, where we can jump, where we can jumpstart our career. As you can see, East is undergoing many changes. For one, I think the changes are good because we, the students, we have a voice in what we want to learn. We get input, input onto our field trips and, relay, and relate back to our mastery learning targets. We are learning and growing every day to do our, into our best selves. Thank you. Thank you. Are you okay with us asking you a few yep. questions? Okay, good. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Floor's open. Mr. Como. You did an excellent job uh, talking about uh, how the changes are occurring. And um, you've been in the program since last, last spring, you spring, said? yeah. And, um, and it was more of a traditional program? Yeah, we spring? used to go from classroom to classroom. Now in the morning we have a three-hour block where we just sit and we do all of the core classes and then after lunch we have this thing called crew where we do like a smaller version of what we do in in uh in the uh, first hours then we go to our fun classes which are like <laughs> 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 um, where you get to do basically whatever we want. Like usually for the past like three months, we've just been playing basketball, which I think that's fun. So, yeah. So from a from a uh, from an engagement point of view, can you talk about the differences between last spring and now for you? Yeah. Well, it was. It's been. It's changed a lot, and I like that because. The room I was in most of the time last year was Miss Fry's room. And uh, she would, or, uh, You're okay. Okay. Uh, Miss Fry's room was, is now created into our lab, which uh, has all of our our Glowforge, our crickets, which are, uh, they cut out vinyl you can put on shirts, on, on whatever else you would like to put it on. Um, it's just changed uh, in a good way, and I really like it. Okay. Have you, um, have you experienced anything that has allowed you to maybe figure out what you want to do uh, in, in the future? Yeah, going to WCTC. I've now, I have figured out what I want to do after high school. I'm going to work for my uncle at trace matic if any of you know what that is. Yeah, he runs that place, so. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think you'll do? Yeah. Nice. Do you know what you'll do for him? Yeah, I'll do milling, uh, lathe work, and welding, stuff like that. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm just curious, in your opinion, in what ways is East High School um, a good example for the other high schools? Oh, uh, smaller classes, um, you get to choose what you want to do, okay. not just told right away what you're going to do. Um, 
you also get to just, how do I explain it? You have more one-on-one -on -one with your teachers, so you can make a better connection with them so then they can, so you can help teach yourself how to learn better. And they'll teach you how to learn better, too. Hmm. So I think that's one of the good things about the teachers at East. Got you. Thank you. What advice would you give to students that are attending East with you? That's a good question. Um, I would say you're doing a good job, and they should keep it up. Well, I would I would say the same to you. I think you've done an amazing job. We're all Thank extremely you. impressed. Thank so um, we wish for your success. Are there any other comments by the board? All right. Thank you all so right. much for your update Thank tonight. You. All right, we are now at the point in our agenda where we have an opportunity for citizens to speak. I am going to um, preface this section with um, a couple of comments. One is that the HR committee earlier tonight did approve a um, staff dress code policy that will be entered into the consent agenda um, and open for discussion um, that did not include the administrative guideline that was presented for consideration. So I just wanted to share that before we begin public comments tonight as a courtesy. Um, I want to also um, alert the community we have 26 speakers tonight. We are going to allow the full three minutes for each speaker. Um, certainly we would ask that as a courtesy to one another, um, you could consider uh, being brief with your comments so that everybody has an opportunity to um, to share. Because we have more than three, three, more than six, three is the limit. Three minutes is the limit, I'm sorry. We expect all speakers to honor our time limit, refrain from using any inappropriate language, and be respectful in their comments. Speakers who do not meet these expectations may be prohibited from speaking at future board or board committee meetings. Speakers are here to address the board and not the audience. The school board does not endorse any comments made by members of the community here tonight. We would like to remind our community members of the impact of their words on others and that our children are watching. We commit to communicating with you in respectful and productive ways and ask that you do the same. We also expect that the audience will be respectful of the speakers and of the board and refrain from responding with verbal comments, cheering, applause, or other behavior that will detract from the meeting. Please note that no obstructions can be created between the board and the audience. Visual aids cannot be used, and the area behind the speaker and the podium will be clear during public comment. Also, in order to respect our speakers and our meeting participants, please silence your cell phone at this time. Our first speaker tonight will be Brian Flood. Evening. Uh, if I knew you had a marching band every day of these, I probably would have attended a few more earlier on. Um, first of all, thanks for letting me speak. I am here as more of a concerned citizen and also a parent of some kids. Uh, regarding the parental rights and transparency, um, I got some changes I'd like to propose to the draft that you have in front of you. Due to the time, I will limit and uh, highlight just three of the concerning areas I see as a parent and provide a written commentary to the secretary when I'm done for you to review at a later time. Um, regarding section one, item A, require written permission to use nicknames. I, uh, the section, this section is written incorrectly from my perspective. Having each parent list names and nicknames of every child of the 12,000 students in the Waukesha School District, to me, is a waste of people, parents, teachers, resources, time. I would strike this section and add the following to the deeply held family value section. Any parent who wishes to rate, limit the pronoun, name, nicknames, or formal names will provide a written statement to the school. Regards section item one, item, or section one, item B, athletes approved to be part of the WIAA. Strike this section. Students who participate in athletics programs must be consistent with the rules and regulations of the WIAA. 
Schools should not add rules, regulations, or processes that supersede these regulations. The equivalent to me is saying that school board has to approve all handicaps before moving on to Special Olympics. At no point should the, also, at no point should the school board set policies that allow the school board to force families to share medical information. This would include gender, vaccination status, medical therapy, or any type of medical needs. Specifically, this is in direct contradictory of the deeply held family value section. This district, quote, this district will not mandate physical or mental examinations or medical intervention beyond statutory or obligation needs. Last statement, political request to the state legis legislature. Please understand how dangerous this statement is within the greater context. The board clearly indicates politics should, not be, politics should not be part of our students, teachers, parents, administrators, or school board. However, this statement erodes any confidence that this is not a political resolution. The school board is an organization that is tasked to look at what is best for the student. Per the policy laid out in this seconds. resolution, district facilities and district physical assets, such as furniture, equipment, and computers, to be free of political and ideological messaging. For me, the school board has lost a lot of teachers, respect from parents, staff, and community when the school board implemented a very powerful resolution with 2240 and declined free school lunch. Politics is a terrible thing in schools and even worse at the school board. Parents' ego, school board ego, my ego means nothing. We are here for the children who are in school for 12 years of their life and they don't need politics Thank you. degrading that. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Tom Nutsky. Hello, everyone. I came to speak to the board to say thank you for the work you do. I know it's stressful. I'm sure you get more complaints than compliments. I came here tonight to compliment this board for staying on course of promises made and promises kept. Keep education at the front of your decisions. Keep all the noise of today's crazy world as a passing narrative that will fade into history. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. The next speaker is Carrie Kumral Minus. Minus. So I will be honest and say that my original speech that I came to give about the dress code tonight um, has changed significantly after attending the HR meeting. Um, I was set to come in and talk about how uh, I wanted you guys to show me how student achievement was tied to whether or not I wear Converse on my feet every day, um, the studies linking what a teacher wears. Um, to student achievement and test scores, which this board obviously places very high value on. Um, but I was heartened by the meeting in the HR and uh, some of the things that were said. Uh, it appeared in the original document that this was an attempt to further control and limit the rights of teachers. Um, and since there's only two board members who have actually been in a classroom in any educational capacity, I was afraid that we were going to a place where we didn't understand what actually occurs in a classroom and what a day for a teacher typically looks like. Um, I just wanted to reinforce that we stand on concrete all day long. Um, some of us are working 50 to 60 hours a week in those buildings. I usually uh, take between 8,000 and 10,000 steps a day. Um, many of our special ed staff are changing diapers. Uh, ch I've had to chase students out of my building and across the street. Um, our kindergarten teachers are on the floor all day long. Our tech ed teachers not wearing tennis shoes or sneakers is actually a safety hazard. Um, we need to be cognizant that we are no longer in the 1950s of skirts and dresses and high heels and kids sitting in rows of desks. We're moving around constantly all day long. Um, and business casual, which was stated in the HR meeting, business casual in the educational setting is very different than business casual in the business world. And I appreciated, appreciated that that was mentioned. Um, I did also want to say that as a middle school teacher, what I wear actually establishes and helps build relationships with my students. Um, middle school students, as you know, are very into fashion and sneaker culture. So when I wear my Nike blazers, that that creates a conversation, it builds rapport. Um, they don't see me as the old lady in the classroom. <laughs> they uh, can relate to me and you'd be shocked how much more you can get out of a student that relates to the teacher in the classroom. Talk about increased student achievement. Um, 
I also wanted to highlight that sometimes uh, spending time on minutia, such as the, uh, the adult dress code in the district, could be better spent focusing on things like improving student behavior or the fact that right now, with our kids currently in special education or the referral process, one in four kids in the district could be considered seconds. special ed. Um, we could take a look at our student dress code, if I'm being honest, because I see more skin in my middle school than I do on social media, TV, and movies combined. Um, so I ask that when you do make decisions, um, you take into consideration the adult employees that you have hired to determine their own professional dress and allow them to dress for their day and their job, um, which is being tasked with educating the kids in our district to the best of our ability every day. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ashley Harrison. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ashley. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from Waukesha North and I'm just going to get straight to my point. I stand here on behalf of the kids who can only be out to the world when they're at school. Uh, those whose home lives don't allow them to be true to themselves 100% of the time for one reason or another. Uh, for them, I think that the parental bill of rights on the table poses a danger because without the privacy of being able to spread their identities only to those who can be trusted with it, there no longer exists a place where these students can truly feel safe expressing who they are. It turns teachers against students, and I guarantee that neither of those parties wants any part of this. Now, for some of you, I realize that I've just spelled out the goal, and that is to eliminate queer privacy. I don't know why this is a cause that ails you, or why it matters so much, but here we are. I ask you to consider what good you think this will do for our students. At best, these policies are unnecessary, and at worst, they will jeopardize students' safety and well-being. On one hand, if the parents already know their kids' gender and sexuality identity, then there's no point in having an outside source inform them of this. And on the other hand, more importantly, if students don't feel comfortable enough talking to their parents about their identities, then why should we force our teachers to be the middlemen? From any angle, it's a breach of privacy. And I implore you, please don't make our schools a more hostile environment for queer youth. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Sarah Harrison. After Sarah Harrison will be Ellie McHenry. Hello, my name is Sarah Harrison. I have one child who is a sophomore at Waukesha South and one child who just spoke to you who graduated from Waukesha North last year. I come before you to speak on the matter of the proposed resolution on parental rights and transparency. I want to be completely clear. This is a political tactic. 100% based on speaking points from national Republican politicians, such as Senator Josh Hawley. We also saw our Wisconsin Republican state legislators attempt to pass a similar parental bill of rights last year. This does not come from organic issues in the Waukesha School District. This is manufactured outrage, and you are playing right into the hands of the Republican Party. Parents already have the right to view curriculum, participate in their kids' education, and to foster a loving and accepting environment with their kids so that they can have such conversations without the school being involved. <clears throat> in the list of beliefs in this document, Number five states that all students deserve to feel welcome at school regardless of religious beliefs, race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. In the list of rights, section 4A states that the staff is not allowed to utilize student nicknames or pronouns other than those, quote unquote, consistent 
with the student's biological sex without written permission from the parent. These two statements are contradictory. One other thing that really bothers me is why does this resolution call upon our legislators to pass laws in keeping with this? When did our school board become a place to further political causes? We all saw that the Republican group Wiss Red bought our last two school board elections. And now they're getting what they paid for. They're getting a school board that values politics over people. I urge you to prove to us you are not in the pockets of a political 30 party. 30 seconds. And to vote against adopting this unnecessary and harmful resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Ellie McHenry, followed by Susie Mitsky. I am speaking uh, to the proposed parent rights resolution. I would like to point out that almost all of the parent rights listed in that proposal have always been parent rights. Those were my rights when my children attended Waukesha schools 30 years ago. If I wanted to know what was being taught or what my children were reading, all I had to do was ask. But this proposed resolution isn't about parents' rights. It is about pushing a political agenda. This same resolution has been proposed in several states and other school districts across the country. This isn't about all parents' rights, it's about certain parents' political agenda and controlling what goes on in the classroom. We have well-educated, well-trained professionals working in this school district. They write curriculum and keep up with the latest technology and literature to make sure that the children in this district get the best education they can to prepare them for the real world the real world that they will live in, not the one their parents or grandparents lived in. We need to let those well-trained and experienced professionals do the right things for students. Instead, you want to micromanage every aspect of what goes on in this district to make sure it meets the personal political agenda of a few parents. Teachers are first responders. We trust them to do the right thing for each and every one of our children. For many children, their teacher is the only adult they trust. When they share with their teacher that mom's boyfriend is not appropriately touching them or that the child is considering suicide, it is the teacher's responsibility to report that to the appropriate authorities. They can lose their license to teach if they do not report this. But under this new proposed resolution, the teachers are being told that they must contact the parents before doing anything. In many cases, that defeats the whole process. Teachers should be able to decide if contacting the parent is in the best interest of the child. Teaching is not an easy job. It is so much more than just sitting at a desk and grading papers. We keep hearing that we hire the best people, and I think that we do. So how about we let them do their jobs without hanging over their shoulders or asking them to do things they know aren't in the best interest of the students in front of them? Stop micromanaging the staff. Maybe then we could focus on what's really important like the achievement gap and student behavior issues. Thank you. Susie Nitsky, followed by Kurt Bree. Good evening. Um, I want to just start by saying thank you guys for following through with what we elected you to do. I greatly appreciate it. And I'm going to start by, and some people say it's so political, I don't believe that my right to parent my minor child is a political issue. In fact, it's the opposite. Those who want issues relating to my child to be secret are interested in doing that so they can implement social and political ideas into children's lives. I want to thank you for considering this resolution to affirm my rights as a parent and for all of your hard work on behalf of our students. I appreciate you committing to working with parents to facilitate a productive learning environment. We know our children best. I urge you to pass this resolution, which I believe protects and supports all students in our great district. I appreciate the effort that has gone into protecting student privacy and ensure that parents 
are the decision makers for their children. This is also a great opportunity for our district to be a leader in the state and continue our commitment to focusing on excellence. Continue to keep the parents informed and keep focusing on education. Thank you. Thank you. Kurt Burry, followed by Becky Gilligan. Good evening. My name is Kurt Burry. I live in Waukesha, and I'm the father of uh, two school-aged children that attend the Waukesha School District. Uh, I got a couple items I want to talk about. The first one is I'm in favor of the parental rights and transparency resolution. I think it's good that we have this conversation and that we put a lot of the what I would call common sense ideas from pen to paper and write it down and talk about it and bring it out in the open. Um, I mean, to me, it, it's common sense. All students should feel welcome. All students should feel safe. Educational standards should remain high. Parents should be notified of what goes on in this school. Because in my mind, it's like, it's like a partnership. You got the parents working with the administrators, working with the students, working with the teaching professionals in order to make a successful conclusion and to, uh, have successful outcomes. Um, so I'm in favor of the parental rights and uh, transparency bill. I think it's a good idea. I'm glad that the board is uh, bringing this up for conversation. Uh, the other item I want to talk about are the key performance indicators, the KPIs. Um, there's been some progress on them. I'm glad the board has them. I think in the spirit of continuous improvement, we have to have those measures. If we want to improve, we have to understand where we're falling short, where the problems are. Uh, but I would like a little bit more transparency on how we're progressing through that. Uh, maybe I'm missing it, but when I was looking at the website uh, earlier today, I saw that three of the four KPIs within the uh, committee groups were still under construction, and one of them, the last update, was September 16th of last year. Uh, really want to see that brought out in the open. Well, I'd like more dashboards, more, not necessarily real time, but more regular updates on how we're progressing on that so that we have our goals followed by the action items that will help us achieve that goals, those goals. So those are the two items I uh, wanted to bring up. Once again, thank you for your service. I know it's a tough job, uh, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Becky Gilligan, followed by Laurel Peterson. Hello, everybody. Um, wasn't in my original speech, but I just wanted to throw out there for all the parents who think that they know that their kids are good kids and what their kids are doing in school. I know very well, I'm not too old to remember how I lied and snuck around behind my parents' back. So what I do is I assume that whatever I did in high school, my kids are probably also going to do. Um, so there are definitely things you don't know about your children that, um, you know, you're, that they may not want to share with you because they're individuals with their own brains and their own personalities. Um, as far as the parent uh, the parent um, rights, um, the way that the language came across to me was very much not supporting teachers. Uh, the language endorses an atmosphere of distrust because parents and teachers are supposed to be partners in their child's education. They're supposed to work together. Um, the, the policy should encourage that partnership. Um, and, you know, and also it should encourage a parent to take a proactive approach to understanding what's being taught in the child's classroom. A parent could volunteer. I don't know, I work. I can't always volunteer in my kid's classroom. However, I know how to access Blackboard. It's right on Infinite Campus under Tech. You can access your kid's Blackboard and that you see the syllabuses and the coursework for every single class they're in. You can look on their Google Classroom. You can also access that. I have um, access to my child's all three of their email address accounts for school, their student email, I know exactly what's going on in their, in their classrooms at all times. So that's all parents have to do. There's nothing hiding. There's no secret agenda. No one is indoctrinating your children at school. Um, I also believe that um, with rights comes responsibility. And I um, actually have a, in front of you, there is my list, what I kind of thought were the most important parent uh, responsibilities. Um, quickly reading through it, parents and their children, uh, teachers are partners. Parents and teachers will communicate in a respectful manner. Uh, parents will learn how to access their children's curriculum via Blackboard, Infinite Campus, etc. And only go to the teachers for more information if 
something is not clear, if they need clarification after using the resources available to them. Um, when differences regarding what the children are taught arises between separated or divorced parents. seconds. That is not something the, the school should be put in the middle of. Um, and um, also understand teachers are college educated professionals specializing in educating children. They need to be trusted for their expertise and their specialty. And I trust my kids' teachers with, with their education because I am not a teacher. I didn't go to school for that. Um, and Your that's, time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Laurel Peterson followed by Jay McDivitt. Hello. I am also going to uh, speak with you tonight on my opinions regarding the parental rights uh, policy proposal. Um, I, there are many concerns that I do have about the proposal, but the one I really want to focus on, because it is quite literally, for some students, a matter of life and death, is the pronouns and using um, of a different name, um, permission or notification by teachers. Um, I went to a board meeting in summer of 2021. Uh, where the legal counsel for the board was there. Um, and one of the board members, who is still a board member, very clearly asked the legal counsel there, well, can we mandate that parents are notifi notified if a student is pretending to be something they are not? The legal counsel uh, proceeded to say this is a tenuous legal issue and pretty much advised against jumping into, uh, that, um, into that arena. I think that comment about pretending to be something they are not illustrates how there are parents and a board member, at least one, who does not understand what it means to be a transgender or non-binary youth. This isn't that simple of just saying, oh, I woke up today and I decided to be something different. This is something they really, really struggle with. Um, LGBTQ youth are four times as likely to attempt suicide as their cis straight peers. And 45% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide in the past year, including more than one half of transgender and non-binary youth. Um, it's because of this that it shows that although, yes, we would like to think that if we um, notify parents that they will all be understanding and supportive, that that's not always the case. Transgender and non-binary youth are not confused or misguided people. They are quite simply people. People who need our compassion, love, support, and understanding. If this is put into effect, yes, it may help the parental rights or, in my opinion, the parental control that parents want to exert, but it will make it so that teachers are forced to out their students and teachers aren't going to want to do this. They will quit and will leave the district before they do that. And as a result of that, students will suffer. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jay McDivitt, followed by Kelsey Draves. Thank you. My name is Jay McDivitt. I have two kids uh, who attend the Waukesha STEM Academy. I am a parent, and I assure you this parental rights and transparency policy is completely unnecessary. I already have the Wisconsin and the U.S. Constitution protecting my rights as a parent. We don't need this. But more importantly, this is deadly. My friend Edward and I grew up in a town very similar to Waukesha. Edward's parents clearly taught him that being gay was evil. His pastors and youth directors drilled into him that being gay would send him to hell. Trouble is, Edward is gay, and Edward hated himself for it. He constantly struggled with extraordinary depression and suicidal ideations. But Edward and I had a teacher whose name was Miss Johnson. 
and Miss Johnson had a tiny little rainbow flag taped to the wall behind her desk. Now, Miss Johnson knew that Edward was struggling. And so he held him back after class one day and she said, look, you don't have to tell me what's going on at home, but I want you to know that I think you're amazing. <coughs> and trust me, it gets better. You will make it better. Just hold on. Edward is now in his 40s, and he will tell anyone who will listen that Ms. Johnson literally saved his life with a rainbow flag and three little words. It gets better. This policy would sever that lifeline for kids who have to go to school to find adults who will love them and support them for who they are and who they are becoming. This policy would have killed Edward, and it will kill kids like him, and that will be on you. Our children have a right to live into adulthood with the knowledge that someone, if not their parents, will honor and respect them for who they are. I beg you to leave that lifeline intact. Thank you. Thank you. Kelsey Draves followed by Renee Messerschmidt. Good evening, everyone. So I'm going to talk about um, and address concerns about the proposed policy changes to the teacher dress code. And I know that you had a meeting on that tonight, but I still want to reiterate kind of what my thoughts were and the thoughts of a lot of the uh, teachers at Hatfield Elementary School. So firstly, I'd urge the board and administrators to be more transparent with what the end goal is of the policy change or the potential policy change. It is simply, is it in simply to ensure modesty and that appropriate attire is worn around our children? Because if that's the case, then okay, fine. Um, but our teachers already feel targeted, especially in an environment where we've already lost two second grade teachers in the last month. Do you know how hard it is to tell your child, your second grader, that their teacher is not coming back after they've made that connection with them? This is after they've already been forced to merge into a school that they didn't want to merge to. So just think about that. Secondly, has there been any consideration to the type of work some of these teachers do in the district or what they're required to do? What about the aides that need to change diapers every day for special education students? What about the gym teachers who are teaching physical education? Should they be wearing loafers to do that? Or will the district be reimbursing gym teachers for dress slacks that are ruined by chewing gum, that, <laughs> by chewing gum left on a chair? This is a true story that happened to one of the teachers at Hatfield yesterday. She sat on a piece of gum. So does she get reimbursed for that? This doesn't feel as if it will be creating a welcome environment or welcoming work environment for our teachers or inspiring our teachers and to educate our children or even to stay in the district. The two teachers that left Hatfield, one did a complete change, we got out of teaching completely. The other one went to a different district that offered better benefits, mid-school year, before Christmas break. That's just something to think about. How does this advance my son's education? How does changing the dress code help my three sons, two of which have IEPs? How does this solve the growing pains of, that we are experiencing on a daily basis already in Hatfield, a situation that people in this room created? Please give some consideration of the transparency that we are asking for and have been asking for for over a year. A year ago, I would not have known any of you in this room, but because of decisions made, here I am today. I want to thank you guys 30 for seconds. what you do, but seriously, let's think about this. Thank you. Renee Messerschmidt, followed by Keith Best. Evening. First, I'd like to address tonight's agenda items, parental rights and transparency resolution. I find it odd that you would try to pass a resolution regarding parental rights and transparency without gathering opinions of the parents in our district. How very untransparent of you. When giving parents more rights to information regarding their children and education, I find it disappointing that the administration and board failed to inform parents of such a decision. Before passing a resolution that will affect parents and their children, you must provide this information to families in an email to give them time to review it, offer their opinions, and to make amendments to the proposed resolution. In other words, you need parents' input before it even comes to the board for a vote. 
Why assume you speak for all the families in the district when you haven't asked them for feedback? If I play the primary role in my children's education, as stated in section one of the resolution, then why is it a select few parents and board members and administration can decide whether my children have access to certain books, educational apps, or even certain historical topics? I find it more appropriate that these educational tools be available to all students, and that if a certain parent has a problem with it, they can exercise their right to not have their child exposed. Regarding section four of the proposed resolution, if this district celebrates diversity, why is the board actively inputting policies that discriminate against it? You can't claim you support diversity when you restrict it. With transparency, will you notify parents of every book, app, classroom assignment, or discussion to ensure that parents' rights are being upheld. When removing Spotify, you only notified teachers and students. Why weren't the parents notified? You want to pass this resolution, but you aren't even practicing the transparency clause you are trying to implement. I encourage the board to hold back from voting, to gather parents' input, and to put those suggestions into consideration when addressing the resolution before the board votes. Second, I would like to address the, uh, the suggestions for teacher dress code. I worked as a chemist for 10 years. We wore tennis shoes on our feet to protect our feet because we were standing all day and from hazards. Guess who else stands on their feet all day? Teachers. Eight hours plus, whether they're lecturing in front of a classroom or they're running around on a playground, it is not uncommon to have a child vomit on your feet. It is not uncommon to have children step on your feet. We have tennis shoes to protect teachers' feet. Also, t-shirts. Exactly what is the harm of a school staff member wearing a t-shirt that represents the school they work at, the sports they coach, the clubs they organize, or the school band they support? Perhaps we should spend less time worrying about what teachers wear and more about the behavioral issues in this district. Thank you. Dave Richmond, followed by um, Israel Elas. Did you skip me? I apologize. Keith Best, thank you. Followed by Dave Richmond. Good evening, everyone. I have been attending Waukesha School Board meetings on and off since I worked in Madison at the state capitol for a legislator, le legislator who represented this district. Since then, my grandchildren have come of age to attend public school in Waukesha, so I continue to show up looking out for their best interests and to keep their parents informed. When I saw the direction public schools in the nation, including Waukesha, were headed, I became concerned. I told the school board if things continued the way they were, I was prepared to help my sons financially if they needed it, if they decided to pull their children from public schools and enroll them in private school. Now my sons are a product of Waukesha School District, K through 12. They got a fantastic education. They graduated in 2000 and 2002. Now things have changed. Mainly because of the current makeup of the sport, things are headed in the right direction. I strongly support the leadership of Dr. Piasek and the Parents' Bill of Rights, and so do the parents of my grandchildren. I encourage you to continue to do what is right and ignore the attacks coming from a very vocal minority. End the woke. Stay strong. Waukesha strong. Thank you. Dave Richmond, followed by Israel Elas. So as a reminder, I talk quite loud, so I don't want to startle you. And I know you've all missed me. I'm back. I'd love to say I'm here on happy terms, but I'm not. Control seems to be an issue with this board, and it continues to be. Let's review some of the recent history, shall we? Accountability. $325,000 in lost fees. School board isn't reviewing that, but we'll put a resolution out, <coughs> and we'll do a dress code. The food COVID program. I don't think we need to go into too much detail tonight, but we didn't do real well on there. Sign policy. Another, another winner there. And then the teacher turnaround. Turnover, I should say. Oh, it's not a big deal, said in this meeting. Well, that number is quite startling and continues to grow. 
Does the board address that? Realize, you know what? Some of it is what's going on in the nation. Some of it is not. Some of it is the pure arrogance of this board thinking that Waukesha is a lovely place to teach. Love to say that would, we can get back to that, but the board has some work to do. So rather than putting a dress policy and having that discussed, brought back memories of stories of belt checks and dress checks and hair checks. That doesn't really help the students at all, and that should be the number one thing, students first. I think that's, uh, we're going off a little bit of target. I'm excited to see about the KPIs, work being done. But the dress policy, that should be dropped. That's for the resolution, it's all about control. Direct from the Republican Handbook 101. It was actually voted and uh, Evers voted, vetoed it. Why do you think that is? Well, it doesn't really work. So it was straight from the Republican as it's been discussed. I believe in some of the meetings that this didn't just come up organically. It's a real coincidence that it shows up the exact same way as it did in those Republicans. So I do believe um, <coughs> we do need to examine whether the open meetings law was broken. I'd also review uh, any of Scott Allen's interest, in both in this and the sign policy. He seemed to be overly involved. 30 seconds. And this is a nonpartisan issue. It should be a nonpartisan issue. It is a very partisan issue that it comes through. I think the board needs to examine other issues in dealing with students first, rather than having the cringy conversations that have been had in regards to the clothing policy and this absolute joke of a resolution. And finalize, Joe, congratulations on your service. You're going to be missed on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Israel Elas, followed by Sarah Vanden Wavel. My birth name is Isabel Islas, and I was born biologically female. Despite what my birth certificate says, my real name is Israel Valdez Guerrero, and I am a man despite my genitalia. I am a junior student at Rockisha South High School, and this rule you are trying to pass, which regards the parental rights and transparency, per student personal and gender identity, is discriminatory and ignorant of the transgender community and will do more harm than whatever good you think you're trying to achieve. The focus and consideration on grown adults' feelings rather than your current students are disappointing and pathetic. I preferred name and a pair of pronouns do not harm anyone at all but hurt the ego of the parents and guardians that want to control their child's identity. School is supposed to be a welcoming and safe place, but how are we supposed to feel welcome when we aren't even respected, valid, or accepted? I have already experienced first-hand discrimination in school and in public for being transgender. There will be more bullying, attacks, and suicides of friends and family who don't want to be seen as something they are not. You have lives in your hands. Do not pass this rule for the safety and respect of your students. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Vanden Huevel, followed by Dave Feel. So good evening, my name is Sarah Vanden Hoovel and I'm a parent and a teacher in the district. Um, I would echo the comments of my colleagues who have previously spoken about staff dress code. It was my intent to speak about my concerns regarding the proposed staff dress code changes. These concerns included the assumption that staff was not already dressing in a professional manner, the understanding that traditional business casual doesn't work with the active nature of teaching, and the, poten and the potentially negative impact on school pride and culture. It is vital to know that the board recognizes each of these concerns and will not be micromanaging staff dress as suggested in the original list of potential changes. Truthfully, we, we lost a lot of staff last year and I think we want to consider what we are able to do to, to help people see that Waksha is the welcoming place that we, we know it can be. Um, truthfully, I felt like the whole staff, staff dress code issue was really a distraction from our combined goal, um, which is preparing students with the skills, tools, and knowledge that they need to be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Feel, followed by Ray Runke. <coughs> Hello, I'm Dave File. File. All right, I Apologies. commonly mistake that, mispronounced name. I'm a uh, father of two children that recently graduated from the uh, uh, Waukesha School District, Waukesha South in particular. 
and I'd like to address the resolution that you um, put forward for this evening. Uh, there are a few parts of the resolution that many people could get behind, but there are many parts that are clearly intentionally being brought forward as a political and ide ideological messaging. It's quite ironic given that those that work in the district are being barred from doing so. So I guess it's do as I say, not as I do. While there are many concerns with the resolution in front of us, I will keep my comments as short as I can and only bring forward a couple of issues that are logically inconsistent in that document. If you, in your first resolution under the listed rights, right number four, part C, regarding athletics, it seems you were so interested in getting your ideological message to your supporters that you either did not read the WIA rules or intentionally overlooked what it requires in order to serve your political and ideological purposes. Your resolution states that, is, that students must, quote, participate in athletic programs consistent with their biological sex and they must follow the WIA rules. But those rules not only allow, but actually mandate that students specifically cannot participate in programs consistent with their biological sex. In the WIA transgender policy, participation policy, procedure one, part E, subpart I, it states, a female to male student who has started hormone therapy, for example, testosterone, is only eligible to participate for male teams. This is clearly a political stunt. The second place where you have a logical inconsistency, perhaps on a more important issue, is the final clause of your first resolution. It states, quote, be it resolved that the School District of Waukesha Board of Education affirms its commitment to expect that the district work to ensure the best possible student outcomes in a safe and secure and inclusive environment. The passing of this resolution, together with some earlier actions, will clearly make Waukesha schools less inclusive and less safe for our LGBTQ students. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for all young people, and LGBTQ students are more than four times likely to attempt suicide than their peers, as was noted earlier. In fact, transgendered and non-binary students... 30 seconds. Yep, in fact, for transgendered and non-binary students, more than half has seriously considered suicide. I myself have read one of those letters that starts, if you are reading this. I hope none of you ever have to read such a fucking letter, sorry, such a letter. <clears throat> sorry, I've got off track. We are fully aware, I'm out of time, I'm sorry. Ray Ronke, followed by Paul Reese. Hello everyone, I'm Ray. I am a former SDW student. I did graduate class of 2022, but I wanted to come speak on behalf of many of my younger friends who are still in high school that could not be here to speak today. This new resolution that you'll be voting on today should not be put into effect. School is supposed to be like a second home for a student. They're supposed to feel safe and feel like they can truly be themselves, even if they can't be at home. This resolution states that teachers would have to call students that are trans by their dead name unless they have written parental consent. Well, I ask, have you thought about the danger that that could bring? You're asking a student that is at high risk for suicide and other mental health issues to either force themselves to suffer in silence or be forced to come out to their parents who may not be accepting and could just double their suffering. I wanna tell you of my own story in School District of Waukesha being a trans student. When I was in middle school, I had come out to a few teachers that I felt I could trust the most. One of those teachers turned out I could not trust, and I will never forget her name, Ms. Groff. I told her, and she said she would have to report me to the office, and she did. And I was then called down to the office and made to speak to multiple counselors, asking to me to describe to them why I thought I was trans in words that I didn't understand at the time how to express because I was too young, but I just knew that's what I was. This encounter alone made me go back into the closet until my junior year of high school, when I thought that the school district had come farther. And I think that they did, but this resolution would make us go so much farther back to a time worse than what it was like when I was in middle school. I'm hoping that you will take the effort to think about students and what really matters and not their parents' political agendas. Thank you. Thank you.
Paul Reese, followed by Stacy Keen. Yeah, because parents really don't matter. Um, first, I want to address the dress code that we were talking about, because apparently shoes relate to students, um, except for all the private schools we go to. You know, private schools have dress codes, and those schools, those students do just fine. They're not struggling to learn. They don't have to have all, you know, newest of weirdest literature. They read classics, and they learn. How can that be? How can students go to private school and learn under those absurd conditions? I know it happens every day in this student, in this, in this town, and we lose a lot of students because of that. I mean, it's, it's just the absurdities that I hear. Um, the other thing is a parents' bill of rights. Um, the one that's being told political, it is, this is about politics all of a sudden. See, I'm old enough and been coming around here long enough that I know the history of this board. And I wear these shirts because of the history of this board, because it attacked the Second Amendment and it decided under its old regime to play politics in here with that. So we, now the worm has turned. You guys decided to play, you leftists decided to play politics so much that you drove the citizens of this town nuts and they actually threw you all out. Not my problem. Um, but this, my child, is my problem. And I have the right to know what is going on. And my child is also a daughter. Happy birthday, Sam. Um, <coughs> she is heavily in sports. She cannot compete against a male. A, a male, a born male with male genitalia is a male. A woman, a female born with female genitalia is a male. There's no getting around that. They'll dig you up in a thousand years and they will tell you what you are. And to say that, that a male can compete in a female and have a play, fair and playing field that a female can get when there are scholarships at, at hand, mind you, is, is absurd. In wrestling, we limit people to their weight. Why? To make it fair? No. So some others don't get hurt. That's why we do these things. There are reasons for it. The name I gave my child is only mine and my right to change alone. And I gave it at birth and it will never change. That is my right to give it. And it is who she 30 is. Seconds. And it is who I, I gave her that name. And the only one that can change it, in my opinion, is God himself. And thank you for your time. Stacy Keen, followed by Rebecca Flaherty. Uh, good evening. Um, I just want, I wasn't going to talk about the dress code, but I think people are missing the point that um, it was brought forth by administration, and from what I heard in the HR committee meeting, the board said no. We don't want to do that with our teachers, um, but I still hear people coming up here and being really upset about it. So um, thank you for doing that. Um, I know teachers were very concerned about that, and I'm glad that was resolved and the board took care of it. So I hope you get some thank yous from teachers. Um, I also want to thank you for bringing this resolution to the board. I and so many others who probably won't come and speak tonight support this 100%. This is why this community elected you in the last two elections. The parents in the community were fed up and voted for change. Someone talked about feedback earlier from parents. That was our feedback. We wanted to be in control. We wanted to have our rights restored where we made the choices for our children and our votes matter. So thank you. Um, we elected you to stand up for the rights of parents and stay focused on education, not ideologies. Parents are not a danger to their children and should never be treated this way. There should be no secrets, no secret conversations, no inappropriate materials in our libraries um, or on the iPads. No teacher should be in the business of keeping secrets of sexuality, gender, um, they are not trained therapists, psychologists, and most that I talk to don't want to be. Be encouraged that many, if not most, of teachers are on board with this resolution. Um, I do want to talk about another huge problem that I've uncovered. 
um, and it is on our school iPads. Um, I have, uh, and this is for our administration, um, it is the protection on our iPads. Once these iPads leave the schools, I think pe uh, parents need to be aware. The email that went out to us was very vague, um, but some of our students have absolutely no protection on their iPads. Um, and I want to know why every administration thinks Twitter is appropriate seconds. for uh, uh, as a school website. I uncovered that Twitter was not blocked and it took three weeks for IT to agree to block it. I've learned from teachers that Waukesha loves Twitter. This is a cesspool of inappropriate adult X-rated content and I had no idea that my children had access to it. I will be digging in deeper to find out what our children have access to under your watch. Thank you. Rebecca Flaherty followed by Charles Harrison. Hi, Happy New Year. Um, thank you for this parent resolution. I've read it a few times since it was posted and for the record, as a parent, you never have to ask for my permission to give me more rights. Um, five days was plenty of time for me to review and I appreciate this meeting following that so quickly so we can hear your discussion as well. Uh, like Stacy said, I also believe teachers will appreciate this as it provides clear direction and it takes them out of being the middleman. Also, maybe children that previously would turn to teachers for support will turn to their parents. We don't expect teachers to stand in for us. We expect them to teach. The comments that this will cause teachers to out students is confusing to me. Um, teachers won't be having conversations about sexual identity with their kids at all. So how would they be outing the students? Um, if a child asks the teacher for another name or pronoun, the teacher should simply say, talk to your parents and have them submit the request. Maybe the student will talk to their parents and maybe this will help parents to see when children need some extra help or have mental health issues. Um, someone said it was a waste of time to ask parents for nicknames and for staff to know them. I, I disagree with this. Most forms I fill out ask what my child's preferred name is. So just put it on your annual enro enrollment, enrollment form that parents fill out. Um, a woman who ran for assembly with the Democratic Party accused you of being in the pocket of the Republican Party why she's in the pocket of the Democrat Party. She said this resolution is not about all parents, which I, again, am, am confused by because how does hiding stuff from parents not help, how does not hiding stuff from parents not help all parents? Um, yes, another speaker said kids hide stuff from their parents, and I have a 17 and a 19 year old, and I'm sure they hide stuff from me, and I'm really glad teachers won't be on board with them, helping them hide stuff from me. Um, the first speaker said it's political to ask our state leaders to create legislation to protect parent rights. How is this political? All parents across the state deserve these rights. These are minors, and we are their parents. Um, lastly, about the dress code. The teachers union seconds. president was up here and said we should be able to trust the teachers to dress professionally. 100% agree. Until I saw the K-5 special ed teacher wearing the Black Trans Lives Matter shirt and the rainbow skirt with her special ed five-year-olds. So yeah, let's trust the teachers, but let's put some guidelines around it so that doesn't continue to happen. Um, so thank you for putting this together. Your hard work and diligence does not go unnoticed. And again, happy new year. Charles Harrison followed by David Wadd. Hello. Um, I've come to you guys before. I've spoken to you uh, since 2020. I've sort of been keeping up talking to you guys. I came to you as a concerned student, a concerned citizen, but now I come to you as a statistic. I come to you as one of the many uh, queer youth that you've been informed about. I come to you as someone who's been discriminated against and who has, had, and who has considered taking their own life. And I come to you to tell you what I want. And I hope you will listen. I'm going to be frank. I still don't feel represented in this district. 
I don't feel any of my teachers are represented by this board. I feel like the public school board is not listening to the population of the public schools. I've seen hundreds of students stand up here and tell you why they feel discriminated against in their district. I've seen brave people shaking and crying up here, trying to tell you what they want. And they powered through it because they care. They care about themselves and their friends. And what you have echoed back to them is that you do not care about them. By passing these, um, sorry, by passing this um, parent rights and transparency, you are showing them that you don't care if you put them in danger. You are showing them that if they have a bad home life, that's on them and that they need to figure that out on their own. And that school is not somewhere where they can get help. And I find that very offensive. And I find that, I, I don't even know what words I can say to communicate that I just feel so ignored. But you can prove me wrong. And I invite you to prove me wrong by answering a few questions. First, what problem would this be solving? What would this not cause? How would this not cause more problems than it would solve? And second, given a parent signs a form or whatever, will they, will teachers be, um, will nickname or correct pronouns usage be enforced? Or is that, again, up to the teacher, leaving an opportunity for more discrimination? So far, these questions haven't been answered. Which makes me believe that the lack of transparency is not between teachers and parents. It is between the public school board and the population of the public schools. Please listen to your statistics and listen to your students and teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Dave Wad, followed by Angelique Byrne. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. Um, I, too, just want to take a moment up here to thank uh, this board for bringing this resolution forward. Um, I think it is an important conversation for us to have. Um, we know that there have been there has been a lot of angst among parents, not just in Waukesha, but in other districts that surround us that have struggled with some of these issues and don't know where their rights begin or end in school districts. I've heard people mention that there's, a lot of this is already encapsulated in our policy. Why is it needed? Well, I think it's needed for the exact reason why I believe you brought it up. It needs to be reaffirmed. Parents in this district need to understand that the school district has a firm understanding of what their role is relative to parents. And it's clearly stated in this, and I applaud you for bringing it forward. I would encourage all of you to, uh, to pass it. And I think the last thing that needs to be mentioned is that this resolution, if adopted, is only meaningful if it's actually brought to fruition through policy and procedures. And I know that there was a clause in there that urges the superintendent to bring those policies and procedures forward to ensure that they're enforced by March 1st, and I would encourage you to do so. And I hope you're already prepared to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Angelique Byrne, followed by Rebecca Roast. Hello, I'm Angelique Byrne. I am a parent and <coughs> resident um, in this district. Um, I am also a former employee. I was a former teacher here. Um, I'm here because I am concerned as a parent and former teacher about the Parental Bill of Rights. Um, much of it, as other people have stated, is already in policy or state or federal law, um, or some conflict, so that's also concerning. Um, another part that really concerns me is the messaging. I think it implies uh, distrust in teachers, and many teachers are already feeling distrusted, and many have left. Um, in the district I'm at now, at New Teacher In Service this year, there are about 80 teachers in the room, and they asked us to walk to one corner of the room of why we went there. 
One corner was for the diversity, equity, and inclusion. One was for the innovation. One was for the money. And one was because this is where I got a job. Every single new teacher in that room walked to the corner for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that speaks a lot to teachers that are leaving other places. And I think that that should be considered when thinking about policies put in place or resolutions that we're looking at like this. Um, at my current position, we have gained many Waukesha employees this current school year, some who have come mid-year, people who have reached out to me about joining. I'm concerned because I'm a parent here and I'm a resident here, so even though I'm no longer an employee, I have this year open enrolled my daughter to a different district. My son is still here. I would love to see things move more progressively forward, more innovative. Um, things that I think kids need, and I think there's a lot of things happening that are putting a focus in the wrong direction. Um, being a teacher in the district, I think there's a lot of things we could do to Im improve academics, but we're focusing on things that aren't there, and it's driving people out, both teachers and some parents for their students. Um, I hope that that changes. There are some avenues that might be good for my son here in Waukesha. Um, I think it's really unfortunate that that in a time that we're saying we should have less politics in schools, that there are people on the board asking and calling for legislature to be on board with this. Um, I really hope that there's people listening um, to the parents and people who are here tonight. Thank you. 30 seconds. The, the last speaker is Rebecca Rost. Rost. Thank you. I hate public speaking. I would rather vomit than stand here right now. So obviously this is super important to me. I have one high schooler and one fifth grader, and one of them is part of the GLBTQ community. When I was in high school, me and my friends started the first GSA in our entire school district in Nina. It was a challenge. We had to go to the school board. We had to fight for it. And ours was not after school widely spread, it was secretive, it was with one of the counselors, and it was during the day. I am now almost 40 years old. I hoped that we had come much further in the GLBT community than we currently are today. And the policies that the board keeps pushing forward seem like you're trying to shove us back in the closet. The world is progressing, and the board needs to stop trying to go backwards. The clothing policy that was put forward seemed to be an attack so that you could push a anti-GLBT, anti-Black Lives Matter, anti-inclusion policy. When you did the sign thing, you have no idea how many kids you affected by not being able to see a flag from a teacher who was supportive or a sign that said, we're all welcome here, this is a safe place. Instead, you made bullying go up my kids have experienced more bullying since this board has taken over and started creating policies that have tried to silence that. You can silence all you want, but the world's going to continue to progress, and we're not going anywhere. All you're doing is harming your student body. Yes, there are parents who probably don't want their kids to be part of the GLBTQ community, but their kids still are. They will be when they leave their houses. They will be when they're adults. And they will be when they're shoved in the closet still in that house. But school was a safe place. And even the smallest thing, like a teacher wearing a rainbow skirt or a tiny rainbow pin or a transgendered pin was something that made that child feel seen, feel safe, feel accepted. For them to be able to say, can you please refer to me by this pronoun? that even my own parents don't accept me by, but you do, that saves their lives. If you aren't part of that community, you don't feel it, you don't know it, but I'm telling seconds. you how important it is. You need to step outside yourselves and your lives, and you need to understand somebody else's perspective, because for them, it is their lives. It is what might save them from trying to hurt themselves. Thank you. That concludes our public speakers tonight. I do want to thank the community members here tonight for being respectful in your comments, um, for staying on time, and for respecting one another. Thank you very much for that, um, and for the courage to speak in public.
The next item on our agenda is minute approval. We have two sets of minutes on the agenda for approval tonight. One is from the December 14th regular board meeting. The other is from the January 5th, 2023 executive session expulsion panel. Mr. Como. I move approval of the minutes as presented. Thank you. I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Montijo, thank you. Any comments or questions? Okay, Sue, so would you take the roll call, please? Corey Montillo. Aye. Mark Borowski. Aye. Patrick McCaffrey. Aye. Anthony Zenobia. Abstain. Markel Moore. Aye. Carrie Kozlowski. Aye. Joseph Como. Aye. And Kelly Piasek. Aye. Passes 701. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the communications um, and WEF report. Um, Dr. Siebert, communications? I used my. Mr. Lemire. You used your pass already. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Borowski. All right, thank you, Dr. Piasek. Uh, so regarding the Waukesha Education Foundation, uh, they last met uh, last week. Uh, the board met on January 5th, and we're gearing up for the February event, which you sh all, should all know about, the Evening for Education. That is on February 16th, so about five weeks from tomorrow, I think, if my math is correct. I uh, hope to see you all there. And we're almost filled out of the table space and have room maybe for about 45 more people before we cap out at 300. So it's really uh, amazing that it's going that well as far as um, attendance. So there's a few sponsorships left to sell. I'll just list them here quickly. Two dinner sponsorships for 2,000 each, two appetizer sponsorships for 1,000 each, a presentation sponsor for 750, an award sponsor for 500, and there's plenty of ad space available um, in the brochure. So we're willing to work with companies to make it work in their budgets. So if you know of anyone, please uh, let us know. And let us know soon, of course, because the signage is going to be going out to print in just a couple of weeks. Um, as I mentioned last month and just following up, we did welcome a new staff member. She started, uh, Amber Williams. She started in December and already hitting the ground running and um, really just going to be a great team with Lynette. So it sounds like it's, it's off to a great start which is good to hear. Um, 2023 grant window will be opening on February 13th and stay open until April 7th. So uh, school district of Waukesha employees are eligible to apply. More information is going to be going out to staff in the coming weeks, so we can look for that. Um, we'll be meeting with each of the high schools to announce our 2023 scholarship opportunities. They're already, um, we have three new scholarships this year and three more pending. If you or someone you know is interested in starting a scholarship, please contact Lynette. And again, just looking ahead to save the dates, February 16th for the Evening for Education at the Milwaukee Marriott West Waukesha, uh, June 13th for the Partners in Education Reception at Carroll University, and then August 3rd for the 17th Annual Golf Outing. That's all I've got. Thank you, Mark. All right, the next item on our business, the last item on our agenda in general business is discussion and consideration of approval for the parental rights and transparency resolution that was shared with the board on Friday. Um, I will start the conversation here by giving a little bit of the history of how we got here and then um, open it up for discussion. Um, last fall, specifically in our October student services meeting and other committee meetings, there was discussion around policy 2416, student privacy and parental access. Uh, policy 2240, Controversial Topics in the Classroom, and, and the Policy Series 7450, Technology Acceptable Use. Uh, part of the discussion of the October Student Services Committee meeting was a commitment by administration to develop a statement of philosophy around how identity-related issues would be handled by the district. At my request, the administration um, brought that statement of philosophy to a posted open to the public work session that occurred on December 5th, um, where all board members were in attendance. During that meeting, we also had a budget planning session that was agendized, and um, as was agendized, um, communication and transparency by the district. We um, discussed the administration's recommendation, or uh, not recommendation, the administration's language around a statement of philosophy. And at that time, it was uh, the consensus, or the, I wouldn't say the consensus, there was um, feedback on that 
document that it was insufficient to address some of the concerns or questions about transparency and communications. During that time, I um, explored with the board the notion of having a resolution to address these items, in particular because of some of the comments that were shared here tonight as well. There are many policies in place. We reference those policies often. But when we talk broadly about communication with parents and community members, we forget sometimes that we have the policies in place that actually govern some of that behavior um, and those decisions. However, there were some that were missing. And that's where the discussion led us to. How do we take on policies one at a time if we don't have a guiding principle, set of guiding principles that direct us where we're going with this? Um, I will also add that a board member um, drafted and requested that we consider a policy specifically around parental rights. As board president, I have the opportunity to decline entertaining that policy if I felt like it was redundant with other policies we had. And so I did ask that board member to consider the, a, a draft of a resolution as a possible alternate strategy. So I just want to kind of lay the groundwork on that. Um, with that, I drafted the resolution that was distributed last Friday. I appreciate the compliments, but I do not know what the Republican playbook is, nor do I have a copy of it. And what is in this resolution was my best attempt to synthesize the requests, concerns, and issues that have been coming up at committee meetings and board meetings over the past year, and at the request of board members to have more guidance and more procedure around how we handle these issues. I also want to reiterate that I am a parent in the district of three students. I've been in the district for 10 years. I am in classrooms. I talk to a lot of parents. I talk to a lot of teachers. So I did not put this out there as um, a done deal. I did not present this as the final answer. We transparently distributed this resolution to the board members and the community at the same time last Friday. I went out of my way not to entertain dialogue about this before this meeting. So at this time, and I believe this is the way it is supposed to work, I will open the floor for comments and questions and consideration of any questions or changes about the resolution. Thank you. Mr. Zenobia, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I would just like to begin by saying uh, thank you to Dr. Piasek for all the hard work that she put into drafting the resolution um, and all the input that the board had on this. I know we talked about um, the rundown of what our, trans our, our progression through this. And so uh, it's, it's been several months since last fall that we've, we've discussed this to some degree. Um, I believe it's, uh, I support it on the basis that I believe it's vitally important that we have uh, parents' rights affirmed when many of our legislatures at the local level, at the state level, even at the federal level, have not made these uh, made statutes or laws or, or what have you, policy clear. This resolution, in my opinion, addresses uh, a blind spot in our current policies. I'll get to that in a second, but it does affirm the rights of all parents. And I believe it affirms the rights of uh, what, what we've heard from some people tonight in the LGBTQ community and how they address their children at school. The blind spot that has existed in policy has been where elementary and middle school children um, who may be going through something are not, um, potentially not, uh, having their parents know of those situations. 
Now, I, I do not um, draw any conclusion about what is currently going on in the district, but it has gone on in other districts and all over the country. We've all uh, heard and seen some of those, uh, those stories. We currently work as a district through this process and my understanding to address these issues and accommodate certain things. The blind spot is where parents are not involved. And in these situations, we need parents involved. We don't have clear policy to get every parent involved where these situations are currently in the district. That, to my understanding, I don't have a, I don't have a number. I, I don't have a, any idea of what that is. But we are a large district, and I personally believe that that exists. So this is attempting to bridge the gap so that all of our parents and all of our students that attend here um, can have a conversation where needed with administration to uh, set these policies in motion. Um, so on that basis, I, I know a lot of that has to do uh, in the points that speak directly of, of gender identity and sexuality. And I think those are, are what part of this is very important to address with this resolution. So I will begin with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zenobia. Um, I did see some other hands. Mr. Montijo. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse my voice this evening. Lots of comments, lots of subjects, lots of places to start. Um, but let me start here. Um, the most dangerous thing we can do as a board is place our students in harm's way, um, regardless of, or that can happen in many different ways. I have heard that this policy or resolution or statement could result in the outing of students um, to their family members. Um, that can be a dangerous thing um, because parents, as this resolution talks about, have the right to their own ideas um, and how they raise their children and what their beliefs are. Um, and once we get into that, it, it, we get in dangerous territory. I have read this and I promise I'm not trying to be snide or purposely dense. I do not see anything in here that obligates or even insinuates or suggests that district employees need to, should, or it is our policy to out students. What I read is that if a student requests to be called by a different pronoun, different name, that the district policy and direction to our educators and staff is to only use the pronouns and the name and the common derision or derivative nicknames. I don't see anything that says these educators and staff has to notify the parents. Um, that being said, maybe there, we should have a discussion about, we should be clear on what happens when that does happen, if this is adopted. Should there be a prohibition in this policy that says, we do not out students. We're in the business of educating students, not raising them. Um, that's the parents' pr prerogative. And when I say parents, it's inclusive of step-parents, guardians, all those other situations. We just can't say those 15 different characterizations every time. Um, so I guess I'd like to have some discussion on whether I'm missing this, um, what the other board members think as to what may be appropriate. Uh, because that situation, if this, <laughs> I should, I, I'm about to say that situation will happen. Situation does already happen in our schools. This is happening. Um, so if this policy, if this is adopted, what is our policy? What do the educators do? If someone says I want to be called Jane and their name is Jim, then they say Jim, but the teacher may have some questions or individual, what do they do? Do they just sit in the information? Is there an obligation to report? That's where I'm seeing the danger. So lots of comments. That's the start of the one. Mr. Matthew, may I just want to make one clarification because I caught myself in a couple of things that I said, and I think we're all kind of confusing some of the same words. Um, I, I expect that people will kind of confuse policy and resolution. Obviously, there is a difference. So we're talking about a resolution. I think I might have called, referred to it as a policy, and I didn't intend to. Um, 
So the, a resolution itself is a statement of sentiment and expectations by the board. We are speaking in the first part about recitals, things that we believe to be true, and then the second part about things that we wish to be true or true or to be enacted. Um, and so in that second part um, is where some of the request for action is. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that, again, with my, and my intent was um, to set the guiding principle or the sentiment through resolution, but not, um, not to think that we would leave here with all of the procedure necessarily completed. Um, but this stems back to some of the prior conversations, especially that October student services meeting, which was, where do we even start with this? How do we set the guiding principles so that we can begin to clarify if we have the policies in place or not, or if we have the procedures in place or not? Um, to your point, I would just offer that it was um, this question of outing um, was deliberately not included. That was not ever the intent. Right. Right. That's what, that was my understanding. Yep. I wasn't suggesting it was. And please continue. Same. I apologize. I just wanted to set some clarification because I think we both most misspoke on policy, but it is a resolution. I definitely did. And thank you for the yep. clarification. And my comments along these are, are concluded on that for that, that point. So thank you. Mrs. Kozlowski. Thank you. So just to Mr. Montillo's point, clarification. The kind of the intent is, as I look at this, right, is, is the recognition that the parent is the fundamental owner, owner, not necessarily the right word, but the right and the fundamental leadership, guardianship of their minor child is the parent. The, you know, I think a lot about accountability, right? So the accountability that I have as a parent is to indeed parent my children. The expectation and the accountability that I have of the education system and the teachers is to teach fundamental educational principles that they need to thrive and survive. That the part where we come in to talk about ideologies and changes in identity, our staff are not trained, qualified, set to be able to influence, coach, guide that. And while this information may come forth to them, to me, they have an absolute responsibility. They must report this to the parent. And that is, to me, a lot of the intent that I would see with some of this, and I think some of the concern is parents being left out of what some in our community want as a great partnership. It's hard to build a partnership when the execution on one side is withholding information on a minor child that by definition is not developed and mature enough on many of these things to go solo without the act of dedicated support, parental involvement, or a support network, um, I would struggle that the intent is not if a child gives a teacher a note that says it's that there isn't an immediate conversation with the parent. And I think that there's pieces to that that make it challenging, right? Safety is a piece. And if we are aware that there is a safety issue within that child's home, it would direct policy for us as to how do we navigate that to protect the student, but we definitely don't withhold that information. And for me, you know, again, I appreciate this resolution. I think it's it's very well done. But when I think about myself as a parent, I am fundamentally in charge, responsible for the overall well-being of my child, which includes their education, their health care, their their entire livelihood. The time that they are in school is not enough for someone to have a dedicated understanding of everything about that child, not like a parent. So I'm not sure, Mr. Matthew, if that's where we are going. I just want to understand, is, is are we saying that that is not the intent of this, that in the event that a child presents a teacher, that the parent would not be notified?
there is nothing in the resolution right now that would, outside of the a change to the names or the pronouns, that would require a parental consent. But I, with on that specific Correct. topic, yeah. So if I look at item seven under our beliefs. Minor student questions of gender identity and sexuality are personal and private. Any involvement of these topics by st school staff should be done with the full consent and collaboration of the parent. That is how I would interpret a student giving a teacher a note or something or a conversation that I believe in a different gender identity. So to me, I think it's in. It's the piece then from a policy standpoint, as this would direct then for the superintendent to direct with student services and how, how do we direct that? Mr. McCaffrey. I think that um, there's a difference between a resolution and a policy. Mm -hmm. Huge difference legally. So anything really in here um, is not policy and it wouldn't, it wouldn't go to policy that's why it's called a resolution and not a policy I so this would not direct really and it's the belief of the board it's not the policy of the board if but if I understand what dr. Piasek said mm -hmm. is that this resolution is a culmination of you know things that I've heard common mm -hmm. sense things right that we do have multiple mm -hmm. current policies on right so a lot of this is hard to write right. one policy when we already have numerous policies in place that are covering many of the things that this resolution says that I believe in. Right. So the but action then from this is how do we... Only if that statement is in a policy. But that would be the action to the superintendent. Superintendent right? does not create policy. We do. So if that statement, <coughs> number seven, and I'm just, this isn't an argument. I'm just letting you know the difference between a resolution and a policy. Minor student questions of gender identity and sexuality are personal and private. Any involvement in these topics by the school staff should be done with full consent or collaboration of the parents. That's what we believe as a board. Now, if that, that number seven is in a policy somewhere, because we, we did talk about at the board session to get, gather up what's in the policies and put it in the resolution, do we know if number seven is actually in a policy? Because if it's not, the administration cannot create guidelines around number seven. Okay. Unless it's in a policy. So. So, and that's why I would love to have, you know, see what parts are in policies and what aren't. I, under, I understand. But here it says, be it further resolved that the school district of Waukesha Board of Education directs the superintendent to develop and or confirm procedures to, for to, to fully protect these rights. So we are saying that these beliefs, this resolution, then we are asking the superintendent to effectively execute with procedures or policy to carry this out where we don't have them. Right, as long as the belief, as long as one of those is in a policy. Or a new policy is created. Or a new policy is created, correct. that is correct. Then we're on the same right. page. Right, so if number seven is not currently in a policy, the superintendent cannot create a policy or a guideline based on it. Understood. You know, yeah, so that's, Understood. I mean, that's just the difference if, you know, and I don't know if, I have never seen that in a policy. Do we know if that number seven is in a policy? It's not. I don't think it is right now. It's not. Um, there, there, is, um, there is some content in that um, context in um, pardon me, um, policy 2416. <coughs> Um, and policy 9250, but that would need to be that would be need to be revisited. Yes, right. Um, and I will just clarify to Mrs. Kozlowski's question that um, there was a reason, and we can't ask the superintendent to develop policy. Um, could recommend language for policy certainly, but um, to develop or con confirm yes. the presence of procedures, and that may require right. us to develop policy. It's gonna be, I think it might be on some of this stuff. May a little bit more work. Than just passing the resolution going forward, this will be a little cleanup behind the scene, you know, in committee. Right. If, if right. This and is passed, Mr. Prowski. Yeah. It'll there'll be some cleanup to be done at at policy, um, for sure. Okay. 
I have to go to Mr. Como first, and then I'll come back to you. Mr. And Como. Just based on <clears throat> the last couple conversations here, I wonder if this resolution might be, um, we might want to consider striking the be it further resolved, and be it further resolved <coughs> with um, the details of, really we're, we're, we're saying we want these procedures to happen now. We're pushing that in a direction onto our superintendent, onto our legislators. There's different ways of doing that. And this document may stand better by itself, just focused on the belief side. Just a thought. You're saying just the further resolved mm -hmm. areas, mm -hmm. not the um, therefore. Initial, therefore, be a result. You're talking about the content on page three. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think if it's a resolution, we have to we have to have two parts. And Correct. I, I, I guess what I'd like to see is this, is the belief come out, have the focus be the belief, and not what to do in this. So th there would be, I think, a fair amount of work to perhaps get to that mm -hmm. point. Thank you. Well, along those lines, and not to belabor the point, but I think it's good for us to continue to discuss this, not only for our own clarification, but for the communities. And as I listen to public comments tonight, and you, you all this evening, I mean, I heard this called a resolution, a policy, a rule, and a bill of rights. So along those lines, and I think, Dr. Piasek, you started to explain the difference between a resolution and a policy, and what I got from that was basically the, the resolution, our guiding principles to our policies. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So... If that's the case, then I would, I'd recommend that part that you wanted to have out, Mr. Como, to really to stay in because I think we're saying, if these are our common beliefs, let let them guide our policies. Um, and then also along those lines, I know I believe we um, review all our policies on an annual basis. What about resolutions? Is that in any kind of calendar of review? Um, just I don't know who can answer that. So these are much more infrequent. Um, just to clarify, though, there, there is not a resolution if there's not a statement of resolution, right? It, it becomes just a belief statement, not a resolution. Um, those items that are listed on the rights, uh, I'm sorry, on the um, recitals, which is the um, belief statements, um, are the... Are the um, precipitating the um, resolution statements. And the other point I could clarify too is based on our initial conversation about administrative philosophy around rights and, and um, student identity, um, those were the three sections, curriculum appropriateness and transparency, student privacy and safety, and then the whole collective area of beliefs I or values, I, I chose to separate those because I felt that the deeply held family beliefs were related to curricular content and that the personal and gender identity was related to student services related engagement culture content. And so I separated them deliberately so that would actually give us the flexibility to remove, accept, modify, change certain sections, and not have it all kind of mashed together. Yes. Thank you. Um, as I stated earlier, I kind of wanted to expand a little bit. Um, I, I'm trying to look at the issue of student safety and danger came up. That's what I'm looking at. That's what I, I didn't see it in here. I don't see outing students. I know some people disagree on what the policy is, and that's a policy discussion. As the other board members are talking about, this is a resolution. So I'm trying to see, is there anything dangerous in here that creates a safety concern for students. I don't, I don't see it. Um, and I don't want to get lost in the, the term is lost in the weeds. I don't want to be disrespectful to the issue we just talked about, but there's a whole lot more in here than just what we just talked about or what I mentioned. And some of these things, as a lot of the public comments were, are so common sense. Some of the co public comments were, if they're so common sense, we don't need to, there's no point, we don't need to do it. That makes me a little nervous. I understand that comment, but if it's so common sense, let's put it in writing, and it's not going to hurt anybody, and let's, let's get all on the same page. It's, as Dr. Piazic mentioned, the purpose of a resolution. Um, 
there's nothing else in here I disagree with. Um, what I was really focusing on is, is there, you know, a, a danger um, that I can see in adopting this resolution to our students? Um, and we're speaking broad terms. We have 10,500 students, if my number is correct. Um, there's no perfect resolution. There's no perfect policy. Um, so I start with what's, is it dangerous? I don't see this as dangerous. It confirms, and talks about very specifically parental rights and transparency. I, I don't see a disagreement with, with that, with these as written. Um, as far as our role as board members and on this particular board, I would love to strike the second, be it yet further resolved. I would love if that would happen, if the state legislature would take these issues up, but that's my personal political idea. I don't think we need to get in the business of directing or suggesting to the state legislature, the U.S. Congress, and whoever else we mentioned in here um, adopt certain legislative initiatives. Um, I get why it was done. Um, frankly, I, I doubt they're going to take our direction. I, I don't think we need to do that. That's not our, I don't think it's our business. Um, but that, I you know it wasn't articulately stated, but that's what I'm seeing. There's a lot of good in here. Uh, I think a lot of things a lot of people agree with. Um, I think we need to be careful that it's not dangerous. I don't see an outing of students. If that would be added or suggested that that is our resolution, I would be against that. I, I just don't think it's, I think it's a safety concern. Um, so that's all. Mr. Zenobia. Uh, thank you. Uh, just <clears throat> from listening to the conversation uh, to this point and, and looking again at, at point seven, I think maybe there's a little bit of confusion, or was perhaps, and, and probably more so in the community now, uh, with some discussion around that point. And the fact is, to my understanding, when we talk about minor students having question uh, of gender identity or other questions related in that same area, there already exists procedures in our district um, to, to handle this. I mean, we, we clearly have uh, students and parents in our district that um, are already being that, that administration is already working with, that their parents are already working with, that we already have some of these procedures in place. And uh, because if we did it, how then would we have these students uh, in our district, I, I guess? Uh, we're accommodating students now. And that this does not change that at all. What it does do is make sure that for those students um, that are maybe at the beginning of a process and that their parents know so that other procedures need to be written after this is passed or whether this isn't passed. We will need policies and procedures to cover those other areas in the district. Um, and you know, I don't know if um, administration can clarify that a little bit, but I think there may be some confusion around this conversation as to what currently happens when, when a student um, comes to the attention of whoever and says, you know, I am this person, I need this help. We're accommodating that now. And so this is affirming the rights of all parents, not only parents that um, are dealing with this or not, all parents are covered here. So I think that's why this is vitally important. So I, I don't know if administration could clarify how we currently handle these instances um, that exist uh, in a very generic way just to show that there are procedures in place now. So. Thank you. Uh, this is, I mean, <clears throat> first and foremost, the staff in the district work within the scope of their license, uh, within any policies that the board has approved, within any parameters that are set forth uh, in the law, 
around what their job can or cannot do. So that's how our staff operate. That's the direction that they're given. If a student comes forward um, with a, a, a gender uh, identity uh, question, if they're coming forward with that, staff uh, know that we have student services staff in all of our schools that can help and assist in that conversation. Um, there have been instances where plans have been put in place to help support students. Those plans are put in place with the, the knowledge of the parent. Um, and the agreement of the team is the appropriateness of any accommodation. Um, as it pertains to gender identity in the last, what are we, 2023 now, the last seven years, uh, the guidance has changed for us. It's been clarified. It's been changed. It's been put in front of us as to how we have to operate. And I think it's important to know that we always have to operate then within the scope of whatever those laws are put forward for us and then the scope of the professional practice that the person can engage in. That changes if you're a teacher, that changes if you're a school social worker, that changes if you're a school psychologist, that changes if you're a school counselor. And we offer different levels of support based off of what the student need is and, and, and where they would be at in that gender uh, conversation. Just to follow up that, I know you had mentioned that there are certain guidance and in, in laws that are being followed, obviously. Are, are those statutes are those um, guidance from a body like you know Department of Public Instruction we, we get guidance from the Department of Public Instruction uh, the Department of Education the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education uh, we have guidance that we follow that's been passed through Title IX through Title VII um, any number of those areas provide guidance that we have to follow and that's just as it would pertain to uh, non-discrimination, harassment, and then what accommodations we would be providing for a student. So we're influenced uh, and given direction by the DPI, uh, by the uh, Department of Education, and then anybody else who can make a law then that would govern how we have to operate in schools. If I may, uh, when we set policy, Dr. Cook, Regardless of the policies and the guidance that the board gives policies, and when we rewrite, rewrite policies, we are still bound by law and statute to make sure that those policies are accurate and correct. Co correct. Correct. I mean, you, if you don't follow what the law says, you open yourselves up as a body to any number of challenges that could come along. And thank you. And I, I simply make that point because. Uh, the, the resolution itself is to lay the groundwork to, to build policy and procedure that is accurate and functional in areas that we do not currently have any. Um, uh, as we heard, much of this has been given to us through different bodies of, of guidance. Um, it, we, we discussed a little bit about this being um, the resolution that goes out to our legislatures uh, at the state, local, national level. And I think that is fitting here because a lot of those bodies have not acted and, and some that have tried to act have not been able to build a consensus of law that governs the population, those that it represents. So, um, for my own clarity and for the board's clarity uh, and for the community's clarity, I, I think what you just heard from Dr. Cook, thank you. I, I think that helps a little bit as to what this is trying to do and accomplish and what work we will have to do after the fact and what administration will have to do uh, to make sure that these areas are governed properly, if I will. So thank you. Mr. Browski. Yes, um, just some clarification um, from administration. Uh, it's my understanding, and I think it might be in the resolution, but for the life of me, I can't find it now. I should have marked it the first time I ran across it. But um, that the school district of Waukesha shares any and all information with parents that's allowed by law. Is that a fair statement? That would be the expectation, yes. Okay. So in any other issue with the, that a child might be having, whether it's grades, discipline, even if it's something positive, whatever it might be, we're compelled to share that information with the parent. All of that is available in the parent portal of Infinite Campus. Check grades, check attendance, check behavior. Uh, when, when there are issues that happen, the expectation is that parents are called and looped in to those day-to-day -day 
uh, things that happen in our schools, yes. Okay, so I guess continuing along those lines, I think that's one of the things that's important about this resolution is if something very important that has long-term ramifications on your child's life is going on, the parent ought to know about it. And maybe in some cases, you know, we know different family environments that um, whatever, the initial reaction might not be what the child had hoped for, but in some cases, you know, it might be. Um, I'm just wondering if the, the administration can speak to other issues that they've had to bring forth to parents. I guess, can you recall any case <laughs> where hiding an issue from a parent makes the issue better? Or came to a better resolution, potentially? There are some things that we don't call the parent to loop them in. I mean, that would be the job of the police. So for instance, if a child was involved in a crime and there was criminal activity that was suspected and that was turned over to the police, we're not in the position then where we're notifying. That's the job of the police officers. They're the ones that are there to investigate that. We stumbled upon it. That call does not come from us because sure. if we get involved in that, we somehow complicate that criminal investigation, then you know we potentially make our schools a much less safer place. Issues of uh, abuse and neglect. That's not a courtesy call to the parent saying, hey, we called CPS. Because the volume of abuse and neglect reports that we've, we handle, and we handle a lot, those are coming from issues that are happening in the home. Those are not issues that are happening in the school. So you don't get a courtesy call that we called you on that. We're not yep. looping you into sure. that initial conversation. I think it's important to note, though, that when our students are facing issues in school, it is our job to bridge the family in. I mean, we are a, we are a fraction of the student's life. So we have, we have a portion of their life. We have a portion of their time. You know, we, we calculated it out, you know, to the number of days and hours and everything like that in a student's life. And, you know, it, it doesn't come out to that much in that first 18 years. You know, we get seven hours a day with them. We have 175 days-ish with them every sc single school year. And we get about 14 years with them from 4K through 12th grade. So we know that we need to have the families involved. But there are some issues, Mr. Borowski, where sure. it, we know what's going on and we can't loop the parent into that. Sure. No, and I appreciate that clarification. I, well, I guess what I would say to that is then the the organization or figure in authority, whether it's um, the police or social services, whatever it might be, they're still making the family aware of they're the issue. They're dealing with that. That's not and a, that's the bridge to a better future, whatever that might be. It is our goal to bring the families in and help support that. Um, those kids are coming back to us the next day, the next week, whatever it is, after something happens. And we have to work with those families, especially, you know, I mean, senior in high school, we know we have a short time left, right? I mean, it's second semester senior year. Kid in kindergarten, we've got 12 and a half years left with that child and that family, and we, we need to have a partnership. Yeah. Okay. For now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? One, uh, following up on your comment, Mr. Browski, one of the policies that's actually referenced in the resolution is policy 9250, which is relations with parents. And um, I think there were some reference to that by our community tonight. Um, and the reason was to reinforce that collaboration between the district staff and administration and parents and families. Um, that was something that um, also came up during the student services conversation um, and has come up during a lengthy discussion about um, technology and library books that's been reoccurring occurring with teaching and learning. Um, there is a responsibility certainly for parents, parents to participate, to seek out the information that's important to make sure that they're informed on how to use the resources that are available to them. Um, I do appreciate your point about um, those phone calls that sometimes are made. Um, parents don't always see, I mean, we like, my, my kids go out of their way to make sure we don't get the emails that say missing assignments, but every now and then um, they catch, catch our attention. Um, but I think that that, you know, that the way that that, that signaling happens, or way that that conversation happens um, with families is very important. I don't think that the, the government or government run schools or public schools have the right to decide whether or not the parent wants to be informed. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've had these ongoing 
conversations around different policies, around different issues, about um, whose decision and is it. And um, we've also talked a lot about um, you know, supporting parental rights, well, maybe I've talked a lot about supporting parental rights means supporting parental rights, whether we agree with the parents or not. It's not about setting a certain way. It's about making sure that the parents are in control of their minor child. Um, I know, unfortunately, there are situations where the parenting is not perhaps what it should be. Um, and we have responsibilities there, too. And I think that is really important to recognize that this is not about um, throwing kids to the wolves. This is about making sure that those you know, adult decisions that minors are sometimes trying to make um, are involving the parents that are best capable of helping them. Um, and that was some of the motivation behind that. I also just wanted to respond to Mr. Como's comments, I think Mr. Zenobia, on um, the further further resolutions. Um, I, I Everything here is obviously up for discussion. I want to explain my rationale. Um, one is, again, a resolution is not actionable without the policy or procedure to support it. So that was the motivation for the initial one. Um, the other was um, I had actually contemplated um, what, if any, notification would be made as a result of posting this resolution to those who are responsible for or have the authority to potentially change um, the, the rules in the state. One of the specific reasons has come up at TNL quite a bit, and that's with respect to library books. Um, the uh, state statutes actually um, exempt school districts and um, public libraries from having obscene and explicit sexual content that's available to minors. However, the state statutes also <laughs> make that a significant felony offense if you don't have that exemption. And I think what we have been running into, um, and I, this is my opinion, is that um, the exemption in the statute is perceived to be um, a prohibition on not purchasing some of those materials. And we have tried to be very specific about trying not to bring those materials, more of those materials into the district, making sure that parents know if their young minor children are checking out materials that may be labeled as, as an adult reading level or a young adult reading level. Um, we have been concerned about the transparency on the publisher level reviews of the content of those books. And so um, this discussion about um, or accusation about banning books or about making, you know, removing books and things like that. Um, the statutes, unfortunately, give a lot of latitude to make those books available to young children for which they're not age appropriate. And that has been an ongoing conversation for us. And that was actually the primary reason for um, Section 1 and um, the call to action for the state legislators. I just want to clarify that. I greatly appreciate the discussion. This was actually the intent. Mr. Moore, please. So, sorry for my lateness. Excuse my voice. I've, Mr. Moore has been a little out, out of it. Like I just pull the kids. microphone a little closer. So sorry. I can hear you. Excuse my voice. Like I said, I told my kiddos, Mr. <laughs> Moore has been a little out of it these last couple of weeks. So I think they can run over me now. So I will say this. Um, I had the chance to actually um, all week look through this. And I do apologize. Like I said, my voice, um, I've been out of it. Um, but I did want to add this. Um, I just could not sit here and not add my thoughts with my colleagues. I will say that... Um, uh, family, uh, uh, a strong foundation for a child is, is the family. Um, and uh, Dr. Cook is right. Uh, teachers, we only, we, 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 we are um, in the child's life for a fraction of the time. And, and we do play a huge role in that, um, in, in, their, in their lives. 
um, but those children go home to their to their families, uh, right? So they go home to their families, and every family in this district have, are going to have different morals and beliefs and and values. And whether I agree or not with those families, I have to respect those families. We have to respect those families. And 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 um, I think that a lot of times in our society now, when it comes to our education and what we want for this school district, is to build stronger families and this is a way to do it to get more families back involved in our school district and also bridge the gap for teachers and parents so we can be a collaborative um, effort a strong um, team players for the child's growth development and academic achievement and I just wanted to add that in there and I'll just leave it right there because my voice is a little low today thank you thank you If there are no comments specifically remaining on the content, I would like to just request we have a discussion about subsequent steps. We could take further modifications. We could take um, amendments. Or we could simply table the conversation. There's nothing to table. I apologize. There's not been a motion. Mr. Zenobia. Uh, I would like to make the motion then to approve uh, the parental rights and transparency resolution. Thank you. Second. Thank you. But Sweet. before we go to a vote, Mr. sorry, Rasky, I, I we, did there, have... There's plenty of time for discussion. Okay, good. All right. Go ahead. Um, I did have something that was confusing to me. So on the bottom of page 2, uh, 4A, basically the statement 4A... Um, district staff will not be permitted to call a minor student by names, nicknames, or pronouns other than commonly shortened or abbreviated full names, for example, William to Bill, Jennifer to Jen, or pronouns consistent with the student's biological sex without written permission from the parent. I just need clarification on that. I don't know if there's a different way to write it or break it out, but I'm not exactly sure what that's saying. <laughs> there is. Um, I have looked at that myself. Um, I believe that it causes some confusion. Um, my, I actually got some feedback from uh, community members on that. My recommendation would have been, uh, would, would be to put um, pronouns other than um, one, put the number one in parentheses, commonly short and abbreviated full names, and then instead of or, put and two in parentheses, pronouns consistent with, because the language is correct. It's the parentheses for the for example that actually, it's, the language is correct as intended. It's the parentheses in the for example that makes it confusing. So it's a simple modification that would be um, adding um, parentheses one between than and commonly. So I'll read it. Nicknames or pronouns other than one, commonly shortened or abbreviated full names, parentheses, for example, William to Bill or Jennifer to Jen, and then striking or and replacing that with and two in parentheses pronouns consistent with the student's biological sex without written permission from the parent. Okay. Does that address? I think so. Um, so then maybe the without written permission from the parent, that's probably separate from two. It's not part of two. So it applies to both one and two. Is that right? I don't want to get into semantics, but I do want it to be clear. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Mr. Montijo. Right. Because as it was written, it said the district staff will not be permitted to call a minor student by pronouns consistent with the student's biological sex without written permission. It, 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 yeah, Correct. I agree, I caught that as well, okay. Yeah. Right, I had been asked if it was supposed to be inconsistent, um, right. but it's not, it's right. not, um, because it's those two things yep. being affirmative. So those two things, shortened name and the pronouns consistent with the biological sex. Mr. Montijo. Well, since we're here and there's a motion and it's second and we're in discussion, and the section, aware is section says the Board of Education believes, I need clarity on what that is, particularly to seven, page one, seven, where it says any involvement of these topics by school staff should be done with full consent or collaboration of the parents, and that's regarding minor student questions of gender identity and sexuality are personal and private. Are we saying it is our belief that 
if parents contact the district and ask if their student is gay or if we have any of them if gay transgender any of those that we will give any information we have had that guidance previously from our legal team and I, I actually like to have dr. cook comment as well I see um, moving forward so I guess yep. I need to know what's what is it now and does this are we saying that we believe that should change so this is an issue that is currently still being decided in the courts mm -hmm. the guidance that has been given is if a parent asks about it we share whatever the status is with the parent at that time if the parent doesn't ask we do not divulge that information and that's been the prevailing guidance so uh, if a child is known at school as being uh, you know a member of the LGBTQ community we do not call and say hey Joe uh, is saying at school that he's gay if a parent calls and asks my mother were to call and ask what's my status what am I sharing at school then we would divulge to the parent the response to that question we would tell the parent that's been the guidance that we've been given. And the guidance has been given from whom? Multiple law firms have put that guidance out as this is being sorted out in the courts right now. Right. And that is if the student clearly identifies as a member of one of those groups? It depends. It's very individual, Mr. Montiel. I mean, it, it, a kid who's walking around in the school, nobody is making a suspicion. It would have to be known information. The social studies teacher would have to know that information upon the time of the request. But you would never make a suspicion of it because, again, that, then, right. you know, that's speaking out of turn on what that kid's status would be. It have to be something that they knew. And, and please don't draw conclusions from what, the nature of my questions. I'm doing my job to ask questions. So I'm doing my that, best to answer them. Yeah, and I'm not directed that to you. It's to everybody else. Um, are we saying we is the legal advice that we've been given for multitude of people or organizations or firms saying what is the risk if we do not do that do not do what if there, we don't answer that question it really hasn't don't gone down into a risk situation right now there's there's multiple cases out there that talk about protecting the students rights right and then also protecting the parents rights right and the balance between the two because school districts have taken positions on either side of this issue right. some will say we're going to tell everybody others say we're going to tell nobody and so the balance between that has been if if the question is asked by the parent we would share the information with the parent if it's not asked we wouldn't disclose that information without the request and that has been kind of the middle ground as we sort through as the courts sort through the status of these cases that is the legal advice we've been giving that is the legal advice we've been given this is the best guidance that we had. I believe it came out a year and a half ish ago. I, I remember we've had these discussions yeah. before. So. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. So, I'm sorry. May I take on? Please. Mm -hmm. Does this belief system, does anybody in this board, this is where the, the resolutions become problematic because we're saying the Board of Education believes. <clears throat> get six of us to agree in one thing is you know, okay That's, there's a yeah. whole lot in here um, does it I guess I the question I'm asking is if I vote yes on this does it say anything different that we have a belief different than what we are doing right now if that, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly. Mm -hmm. I know what you're saying. Yeah. I guess maybe I'd like to hear other board members' thoughts on that. What, yeah. What's your question? Mr. Como. <clears throat> I understand your confusion. And are we going against the advice of our attorneys? Yeah. You know, and what has been precedent? You know, and that's what our attorneys are speaking from. So, yeah, I would, I would caution this. this, this um, you know, I... There's reasons why we hire attorneys, right? And uh, it's not our areas of expertise. I think that this would, this could potentially put us in, in jeopardy, at least this one particular item. So I can, Mr. Ko Ms. Kozlowski, sorry, go ahead. Um, I, I um, did have conversations with our lawyers about the content of the resolution. Um, 
those things in the recitals, statements of belief, are not the resolution. Mm -hmm. So less concern with statement of belief. Obviously, to Mr. Montijo's point, a majority vote represent we 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 make decisions as a body, not as individuals. And so there is that risk of having a, a loaded resolution that you might not agree with all of it. And the risk in that is that if any individual doesn't agree with some of it, that they don't support the whole thing. And that's every board member's right. Um, but the recitals, the belief statements, are not statements of law. I could say I, you know, I disagree with a certain amendment, and it doesn't mean that, that we're going to violate yeah, it. I understand the difference. However, when you go to page three, be it further resolved that the school district of Waukesha Board of Education directs the superintendent to develop or confirm the procedures to fully protect these rights. Now we have told our superintendent to work against the advice. To the extent allowed by state and federal law. And on the rights, not the beliefs. So that's how, so the top of page three, right, says rights, not beliefs. So the superintendent is directed to act on these rights. Mm. That's good, good clarification. Okay. I also, yeah, Mr. McCaffrey. It's important to realize that um, when you say it's a belief, it's not a directive, mm -hmm. the administration. So this is just the resolution spelling out the beliefs of the board, it's not a directive to the superintendent to um, put any of this into action. That's going to be our job further down the road, if none of this is, the parts that are covered in policy, to direct the superintendent. We, we're not directing him under number seven, unless it's in a policy, to um, do anything. It's a belief from the board. It's not a directive to the superintendent. Right, well, well, That's the difference between a resolution and a policy. Right, but I think what uh, Ms. Kozlowski just pointed out is we are directing them to protect the rights, which mm -hmm. it's not page one. Right. <laughs> but basically, we've right. got these beliefs that these rights come from that, that we're directing our policies to be made from. Right, but I think that everybody's pointing back to our beliefs. Right, and I agree that it's just, right. It, right. I mean, we keep going back to number seven, number seven, number mm -hmm. seven. So, yeah. It's, it's a belief. Right, the it's clarification direct. really is more about the rights, one it's through four, page direct. two. Yeah. And I think that that's what we have to understand when we're voting on this. This is what we believe. If you don't believe in these things, then you're going to have to, you know, rectify that on your vote. But to continue to go back to number seven as a concern, it's a belief. We're not directing the superintendent to do anything in that list. Nor could we. It would be illegal for us to direct somebody, the superintendent to do something that wouldn't be on our board policy. That would, those directives would originate from a superintendent. You know what I'm saying? If we have policies that the superintendent, the, the superintendent has directives that are not in our policy, but that does not originate from the board. I can think of one that has been discussed multiple times. It's not a policy of the board, it was an administrative directive. Mm -hmm. So this is a belief. This is not an administrative directive mm -hmm. or a policy or a board directive. This is just what we believe. And then you move down to the rights. To the rights. Which are legally protected. So if we do something, we direct the superintendent to do something that's against the law. I think the superintendent and Dr. Cook would know not to follow our directive. So the superintendent is not going to do anything outside of policy. You know what I mean? I mean, he's not. He's not going to be collecting information and outing um, students because of this resolution. It's not going to happen. We don't have a policy to out students, correct? Correct. So just, I just want to make sure that everybody understands top part's beliefs. Not a directive. Mm -hmm. Mr. Como. <clears throat> Your interactions with our attorneys. Any other feedback you'd like to share um, that they provided? Um, given the go, do they give us the go ahead that this is written well? Um, were there any pumping of the brakes like we should 
caution uh, this portion of it what was that what did that sound like um, I did not we did not seek a approval because attorney's job is to identify risk so there were some um, there was some initial content that I modified specifically about library language about ages um, because there are there are laws that have not been settled as far as who can have right to what information so that um, would be left to that policy development again the the resolution itself is not actionable until it's put to policy. It's a guiding principle. Mr. Montijo. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. McCaffrey, thank you for that too. I was circling around that. I just couldn't say it as articulately as you. Um, so, yes. I, I, I don't want to throw the baby out with bathwater because I have a concern that this could turn into a policy that's dangerous for students. Um, because it, this is not a policy, it's a resolution, <coughs> these are beliefs, right. I got it. Um, I would say that's a check and balance though. It's gotta run through another committee and then approve right. it. Right, right. The board, I mean, w the board has checks and balances, they're called committees. Right. Stuff works through the committee, discussion is had, then it comes before the full board, and then the rest of the board discusses it. So yeah. I totally understand what you're saying, that there could be a policy um, that may um, endanger or inhibit or, or whatnot, but that's the check. Right. You know, and I, is that, I, does that I understand. On my, you know. I agree, because you know, initially the, the way my brain works and I look at this and say, okay, that sentence, we could spend the next three months debating what that means. Oh, for sure. Well, that's what policy, like you said, that's what yeah. the policy discussions are for, and okay. All right, uh, thank you. And it's exactly what I'd hoped for. It would cause some discussion, clarify it. Yep. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. So I am just going to reflect back on um, number seven and, and thinking about implementation. Um, I did appreciate the comments of one community member, maybe uh, it might have been our first one, kind of saying, is this an opt-in or an opt-out? Um, like everything else we talk about, right, with books and other things. Um, in the spirit of parental rights, you know, I do believe as a parent that those things listed in number seven um, should be done with the full consent or collaboration of parents. And the reason for using the language collaboration is that some parents may tell us, I don't want to know, or I don't need to know, or I trust my child to make those decisions for themselves. Um, and again, as I stated, you know, that the notion of parental rights is we don't get to agree or disagree. <laughs> we respect the rights of the parent to make those decisions. Um, so, I would see that sentiment and that that follows in um, sections one, three, and four, that um, we could put that question to parents in annual registration time, because that can be updated at any time, um, is really, you know, do you want to know? Is your is your consent required for this? Because at the end of the day, if the parents are telling us they want to know, um, I think based on what Dr. Cook has shared with us, um, they're asking. Yeah. Um, now there is that is obviously that the, the grayest area when it comes to federal interpretation of Title IX and some other things that are still in discussion, but. Um, I'm looking at this as a um, as a board member uh, asked by the community to look out for the best interests of the families and students, regardless of whether I agree with them, is that I don't feel like we as a board or a district have the right to take these rights to information about their children away from them, or to make the decision unless it's it's based on factual knowledge that the parent not understanding or being um, surprised by the child's information would lead to a situation that caused harm to the child. I think that's a leap. And that's why I wrote it that way. Mr. Moore. So in that situation, well, again, please reiterate the procedure for that specific situation that you mentioned. 
if that may cause harm to the student, and we don't want that. You get what I'm asking, or? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think, I think teachers do understand, in many cases, home situation for students. But I think those are conversations that have to escalate. And they don't stop with, you know, I'm going to do what a sixth grader asks me to because they're not ready to tell their mom or dad. Um, not knowing, you know, not making any judgment about the home situation. If, if there's a known problem in the home situation, that's where I think our student services teams need to be included. And I think based on what I've heard from Dr. Cook, in most cases that is. But that would be my expectation, that those decisions aren't made in a vacuum. And as a parent, if I'm asking to be informed of that, um, and we are deriving the conclusion that there's a a physical or emotional risk situation at home, I think we have an obligation to act on that and respond to that. I don't think it's something where we just say, well, we're not going to talk about it. Um, I think that's our obligation, too. I mean, there was a speaker that commented about mandatory reporting. So I take that seriously. We don't just say, well, you know, parents aren't ready, and so you know, we're not going to have this conversation, even though they want to know. Um, based on what, and that's, again, that's my opinion. So we do have a motion on the floor. There could certainly be um, amendments proposed. I'd heard some discussion about the further resolutions. Um, there could be other motions, or we could put it to a vote. Mr. Como? You had talked about um, 4A and just adding a number one in a parent and a number two in parent. Yes. Um, I'll put forth that amendment. Thank you. Sue, does that um, work for you, what we talked about? Okay, thank you. Um, there was also a small uh, typo that um, Sue had corrected in the paper copy that was on your table. Um, I lose the word every time, but it was um, determining. The word determine was used. Uh, can you point me to the section, Carrie, because I can't find it. It's number three. Yep, thank you. Number three. Hmm. Uh, I'll add that to my determining. amendment. Thank you. Determining. Determine. Determining. Oh, you already changed it then. Yeah. Oh, I'm, my, my copy's got I the. Just it. yeah. It's just not changed on board docs. Oh, gotcha. That's okay. Gotcha. Yep. And uh, from my perspective, um, I, uh, I am not committed to uh, be it yet further resolved. I felt that that was for me a call to action specifically relating to some of the, the legislation that implies that we have to do certain things that we feel are inappropriate, age inappropriate for our kids. And that specifically is the, the obscene and explicit content. So I think the interpretation of that law um, needs to be reviewed at a level beyond us. And for me, that's a strong recommendation that um, there is a difference between banning books and not bringing materials into the district that is obscene or harmful to minors or not age appropriate. And I know there's a differing of opinions about what children should have access to in libraries, um, but I, I don't believe the interpretation of the law is that we are required to give access to that material. What it says is that we are exempt from the felony <laughs> associated with giving that material to children. So that was the reason for that, but that was the primary reason for that. Mr. Como. This point of order, there's been an amendment made. And Thank you. We should That's a good be point. asking for a second Thank you. and yep. focus on that. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for that. Good job. Okay, any further discussion? All right. Um, Sue, would you 
take the vote, please. For the amendment. For the amendment. Thank you. Anthony Zenobia. This, this is for the approval of the modifications that were recommended, not for the um, the resolution. So it's not for the resolution overall? It's just, just, just for the approval of the modifications. Okay. Yep. Anthony Zenobia. Yes. Patrick McCaffrey. Aye. Carrie Kozlowski. Aye. Markel Moore. Aye. Mark Borowski. Aye. Joseph Como. Aye. Corey Montillo. Aye. Kelly Piasek. Aye. Uh, passes 8-0. So we have a motion now for um, approval of the amended resolution. Any further discussion on that? Okay, seeing none. Last chance. Sue, would you take the vote, please? Carrie Kozlowski? Aye. Corey Montillo? Aye. Patrick McCaffrey? Aye. Joseph Como? Aye. Mark Borowski? Aye. Anthony Zenobia? Aye. Markel Moore? Aye. Kelly Piasek? Aye. Passes 8 0. Thank you. Please. Please, thank you. Thank you for the conversation. Um, I appreciate the comments and the input and the teamwork. At this time, we are moving forward in the agenda. We are moving to our consent agenda. We will start with um, presentation of gifts. Mr. Clerk. Uh, two gifts tonight. Uh, Waukesha South Robotics team received a donation of $1,960 from Brian Farrell to be used for core 2062 robotics team. And Waukesha School District received multiple units of dust collection systems with a value of $25,000 from Protex GE Waukesha. These will be used in uh, Woods Tech Lab spaces throughout our middle and high schools. The large unit and hoppers will replace the unit at uh, Waukesha North. Thank you. Appreciate very much all of those gifts and the generosity of those organizations. Um, your agenda includes various categories for approval. If any board member wishes to have an item set aside for separate consideration, you will have that opportunity in a moment. Included in the items for approval are the decisions of the expulsion panel, which met on January 5th, 2023. A confidential communication regarding the details of the expulsion was in your Friday packet, along with the minutes included under item 1H. If any board member wishes to discuss this item, we have scheduled an executive session at the close of the regular meeting. Um, approval of the consent agenda would confirm board agreement with the expulsion panel's action. Also included in the consent agenda are um, policies and bylaws. Policy 2260.02, services for bilingual students, English learners. Policies 3216 and 4216, staff dress and grooming. At this time, if any board member wishes to have an item set aside for separate consideration, please indicate so. Mr. Como. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Piasek. I'd like to uh, look at uh, policies 3216 and 4216 dre uh, staff dress and grooming. We had some uh, pretty significant discussions uh, at the last committee meeting just uh, at 615 tonight. And um, we uh, had gotten rid of the guidelines and merged that into the policy. And I think we should talk about that separately. Yes. Um, uh, thank you. So um, we don't require any, um, any motion or second. Any member can set something aside. So um, we will proceed with the consent agenda, um, and we will move discussion of policies 3216 and 4216 um, to the HR committee section of our agenda. OK. Um, Mr. Montijo, would you be able to present the consent agenda this evening? Yes. Thank you. Earlier this evening, the Human Resources and Compensation Committee approved of one resignation, four retirements, and three new or modified contracts. The information was provided in your packet, and an addendum was placed in your desk. I move that the consent agenda be approved as amended. Second. Seconded by Mr. McCaffrey. OK, Sue, so would you take the roll call, please? Markel Moore. Aye. Joseph Como. Aye. Corey Montillo. Aye. Anthony Zenobia. Aye. Carrie Kozlowski. Aye. Mark Borowski. Aye. Patrick McCaffrey. Aye. Kelly Piasek. Aye. Passes 8 0. And at this time, we'll move on to Dr. Siebert's superintendent report. All right. Thank you, Dr. Piasek, and Happy New Year, everyone. 
uh, very quickly tonight, we're quickly approaching the second half of the school year somehow. And it's interesting because our weather feels more like spring right now than it does winter. Uh, as a cabinet, we've been in the buildings uh, a tremendous amount lately. And I just really want to celebrate our kids, our teachers, our staff, and our principals. Uh, they show incredible perseverance, grit, and determination. And all of that is founded in solid relationships that you see in, in all of our schools, uh, as well as them having fun just in each other's presence. Uh, we're embarking on that time of year where we have a long stretch of school before spring break. And I just want to encourage all of our stakeholders to keep their eye on the prize and the goal of high levels of learning for all kids. Uh, the perseverance, grit, and determination uh, that I mentioned and that we're currently seeing uh, will be crucial as we move through this stretch of January, February, and March. Uh, but as always, together I know we can be successful. And as I often try to say, uh, together we are always better. So. That is my report for this evening, and thank you, Dr. Piastek. Thank you, Dr. Siebert. All right. Um, I just want to make sure that I have the right order of committees here. Let's see. All right, so we'll begin tonight with our Teaching and Learning Committee, presented by Mr. Zenobia. Thank you, Dr. Piastek. Um, our Teaching and Learning Committee had met on uh, Tuesday, January 3rd. We have one action item and seven discussion infor information items. Uh, our first item tonight, the action item, is for the approval of the AP pre-calculus course for the 23-24 school year. The course will be available to students who have completed integrated one and two and algebra two or honors algebra two. On a vote of four to zero, the TNL committee approved the AP pre-calculus course for the 23-24 school year. As presented, the committee requests board approval, and I so move. Second. Thank you. Yep. Seconded by Mr. Como, I think I heard first. Flip a coin. <laughs> All right, any questions or discussion? Sue, would you take the vote, please? Raquel Moore. Aye. Joseph Como. Aye. Mark Borowski. Aye. Corey Montillo. Aye. Anthony Zenobia. Aye. Patrick McCaffrey. Aye. Carrie Kozlowski. Aye. Kelly Piasek. Aye. Passes 8-0. Mr. Zenobia. Uh, our next, uh, our first rather information item was on the technology update or our, our apps. Um, the iPad inventory uh, we went over was completed. There's a total of 271 app, um, apps that are available to students that support our classrooms and supplementary instructions in the classroom. Uh, apps that are available are posted on the SDW website. The website provides information regarding apps, class link resources, uh, web links accessible on student iPads, uh, depending upon grade level and their requirements of their curriculum. Moving forward, the process for onboarding apps will follow an updated multi-step process of review and that is also will be built into the district's curricular design processes. Yes. Mrs. Kozlowski. Thank you. I did want to continue to follow up a little bit on the, the security as it relates to the iPads and a lot of the work that and discussions that we've had with uh, Steve Schloman's team. Uh, we are aware that there are some inconsistencies with the G Global Protect app, which is uh, effectively off of the school Wi-Fi, would make sure that our students are filtering through the district, district network uh, with the protections and controls that we have while they're here. Um, we are aware that there are issues and I know that Steve's team is working through those as well as trying to come up with other information that would help us navigate potential changes, improvements, fixes, um, other solutions so that we can ensure that our students' iPads are secure and safe no matter the location that they are at. Uh, so there's more to that that we can expect from our IT tech team. Thank you. Any other comments? Just a question, Mr. Borowski. I mean, um, do we know how we're going to expect that information? Um, just communication via board email or at a meeting or committee meeting? Or uh, so the discussions that we have had 
I, I would expect that it would be transparent from that. I think it would be direct emails um, between Steve, uh, Dr. Siebert, as they're going through that. Right now, they're, they're kind of in the heart of going through the work and doing audits and logs and then taking a look at other solutions. So I would suspect that will take a bit, um, but then he would communicate uh, uh, either, most likely I would think it would come through TNL, if not to an overall board update. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our second information item was an update on our common school funding purchases, which included a list of book titles acquired in December and all the financial information uh, of those purchases and of other library resources that were included in the committee review and discussion. Okay. Moving on to uh, our third discussion item. Our gifted and talented update. Uh, Tiara Rogers, our Director of Educator Development and the District Gifted and Talented Programming, provided an overview on the Gifted and Talented Program, including a number of students by school, uh, recent updates to the, to the G&T program, and to the SDW program model for the Gifted and Talented students. The nomination and identification process, as well as programming process for grades three through 12. The review included an overview of changes to the program budget and a discussion about potential opportunities to increase the program in the future. I, I, if I could, I just wanted to make one comment there um, because I, I just want to make sure that we take it as appropriate follow-up action for, for TNL, but during the budget planning process as well. Um, I, my takeaway from that conversation was that we are insufficiently resourced to identify our gifted and talented students across the district and that number has gone down significantly over the past couple of years and that's not because they're not there it's because we're not identifying them so um, I think that we have to revisit this in time for the budget planning process um, and whether it might take us a little bit of time with TNL to understand or have a proposal from administration for what the appropriate size program might look like to make sure that we're identifying all of the children that need those types of services in the district. So I'm, I guess I'm asking for, I'm asking myself as TNL chair um, uh, and administration that we could um, find the right time to put that on the TNL agenda so that we make sure it's considered in the budget discussions. It's on the agenda. Thank you. I think, it's, I think it's on the agenda. I just don't know when, so thank you. Uh, our fourth uh, discussion item, information item, was the IXL Middle School pilot update. Um, middle schools are seeking to adopt a supplemental curricular resource called IXL to support grades 6, 7, and 8 uh, who are in need of remediation and or acceleration in the area of literacy and math. IXL is a digital resource designed to provide a diagnostic assessment that teachers can administer to target isolated skills and to better remediate learning gaps. IXL aligns to the district grade level standards and can be combined with existing instructional resources. Our middle schools are currently piloting this tool during a designated skills time during the day. The pilot will continue through March. Moving on to I'm sorry, sorry Mr. Browski, did you have a question? Yeah, just a question on that. Um, is, is this the only resource that's being, um, I guess, piloted right now? I, I think it is for middle school. That was the discussion. We talked about the resources that were available. Um, maybe Ms. Mrs. Landish yeah. can answer that question. Are you, are you? Are there other resources in particular that you wanted to ask about? Well, I, I guess I'm just wondering for, for any pilot. Um, I'm. I'm kind of curious the approach. Is it, hey, we're going to pilot these two and see which one might be better? Or are we, if we're piloting just one resource, is sort of the mindset, we think this is the best resource and we're trying to confirm that? Or um, we're going to pilot this resource where a perfectly acceptable result might be this isn't what we want and that's okay? I'm just trying to get a sense of the approach to the pilots, right, if that so, makes sense. I yep. hope, hope I'm clearly asking that. So thank you for the question. Um, normally in a 
tier one process in a pilot, we would pilot more than one resource. That would be the ideal. In this case, this was a current resource that we have in the system. We currently have this resource that we're using with all of our students with an IEP. So it already has been vetted through that program, if you will, with students. It's a high quality resource. Um, we've also had this resource in pockets in the system in years past. So we know it's a high quality resource and at this point in time, um, we're still having them try it out, but right now all signs are pointing to the fact that this would be a recommended tier two resource that we would um, ask for approval for. Okay. Mrs. Kozlowski. And Mr. Borowski, just to clarify, this tool is currently being used um, to either accelerate or catch up our students, right? So it's a very specific population of students that are using the resource versus a broad pilot that we would roll out to all students, just for reference. Sure, no, I appreciate that. So, um, Ms. Landis, basically what you're saying, in this case, it's sort of more to, we already have experience with it, we're confirming it. Um, I guess I'm just curious in general, is our approach that way for pilots or are they more, um, I guess, open to whatever <laughs> the results of the pilot are, so to speak. I, I'm not advocating for one or the other, but. Right, again, I mean, um, Ms. Kozlowski couldn't have summed it up better, right? Our process normally for a guaranteed and viable tier one process is that we would pilot more than one resource okay. for all students. All right, thank you. That's part of our curricular design process. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Landish. Um, our fifth information and uh, uh, information item was the elementary math curricular review, which was Appendix A. This curriculum is up for review in our design process of the phase of the first phase, and was shared, including the review and pilot process we are using to evaluate two possible resources. This is the first presentation in a four-part series to the TNL committee following the pilot approval of the remake recommended resource will be requested in May. Uh, on to our sixth information item. It was the middle school social studies e update. Uh, the committee reviewed, again, grades 6, 7, and 8 uh, social studies courses. The updated course syllabi were shared as well as some overall highlights since implementing the new curricular resource, TCI, <coughs> excuse me, in the beginning of the 22-23 school year. The metrics that are being monitored over the course of the year to measure the impact of the curricular revision and implement implementation were also provided. <coughs> Our final uh, information item was the K-12 art update. Uh, the overall program model, enrollment trends, curriculum developments, and highlights of the art program were shared with us at the TNL committee. And that Any other? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> that concludes our uh, TNL report this evening. Our next meeting is Tuesday, February 6th at 6 here in the boardroom. Uh, or the 7th. February 7th. One of those two days. February 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zenobia. Um, I would just <coughs> like to add, um, you know, there are quite a few pilots and reviews and follow-ups on implementations. Um, uh, in fact, the last meeting agenda was filled with a number of pilots and follow-ups. Um, as Ms. Landish and I were thinking about, like, all the different programs that have been implemented. We're asking a lot of our teachers in terms of implementation, um, but we are dedicating a significant amount of dollars, resources, and high quality materials into our classrooms. Um, over the last year, we have approved and implemented eight, nine um, different uh, uh, curricular resources in addition to um, seven AP texts. These are not rubber stamps. They're AP texts that have come to the board that, or to the committee that the committee has asked to be reconsidered. Um, so just appreciate all the work that the committee is putting in, um, the, the commitment to funding for these programs, um, and the ongoing activity to make sure we've got the catch up and the recovery resources as well. So I think it's going well. Thank you. 
All right, um, the next committee up on our agenda is, I lost my agenda, is student services. Mr. McCaffrey. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, we did not have a meeting in December, so I have no report this evening. Our next committee meeting is on January 17th, 6 p.m. in the boardroom. Thank you. I lost my piece of paper. What's next? Thank you. All right, thank you. Next up is the Human Resources and Compensation Committee. So, Mr. Montijo. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Human Resources and Compensation Committee met earlier today. Uh, we gave a report through the consent agenda. Mr. Como asked that one of the items, the approval of policy revisions at 3216 and 4216, staff dress and grooming, uh, be removed from the consent agenda and be discussed. I believe now is appropriate. I haven't had this happen before. so. Um, so. Um, what I can, I guess, had the high points. Uh, there was uh, discussions at not this, not today's meeting, uh, but at the last month's meeting where we talked about uh, staff dress and grooming. Um, there was some discussion among the board, or I'm sorry, the committee. Uh, the administration took those suggestions and discussion points, brought that back, um, and provided, uh, I guess, a proposal or some suggested language for a revision of that policies 3216 and 30 I'm sorry 4216 um, I think that was Friday or so uh, last week and then um, made some further revisions to that um, and those revisions um, were discussed and acted upon at the meeting I believe all board members have a copy of the revisions that were Chain, I'm sorry, the motion that was passed at today's committee meeting. Um, so I, perhaps that's a good place to leave off so Mr. Como yeah. can, we can have that discussion. I, I, again, I'm sitting here for Ms. Robinson. She knows what she's doing on this point. I don't, obviously, so. <laughs> it's no problem, Corey. Sorry, Karen, if you're watching. Yeah, so. I, I do agree that, that this is worth some conversation because unfortunately we made the decision right before the meeting and there, I know there was a lot of community interest in this topic and so there wasn't sufficient time to translate all of this back to our community. So Mr. Como, why don't you yeah, start? Thank, thank you, um, and I appreciate the history there, uh, Corey, that you gave. And you are correct, we, uh, as a committee, last month gave direction to our administration to not only uh, tweak the policies, but also put together administrative guidelines. And I think, uh, as I was listening to uh, the constituents uh, make their comments this evening, uh, more in particular at the committee meeting, most of the most of the things that were being brought to our attention dealt with the guidelines themselves, which had a, a list, and I, I can't bring it up on my computer right now or I would share it with you, but um, there was a list in the guidelines uh, of certain things that should not be uh, worn. T-shirts, jeans, um, tennis shoes, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but there was a list there. And um, as we considered uh, the policy and the guidelines in front of us, we decided to eliminate the guidelines and implement, um, take some of those things and move them forward into the policy. And I think, <coughs> and I think we accomplished uh, quite a bit by doing that. I think most of the concerns that we had heard from the people who presented to us, including teachers and parents, were eliminated by doing, by, by, by um, passing the policy that we um, ultimately are bringing forth at this, this time. So you guys did get an update on that. That is before you. Those two highlighted paragraphs are some of the things that came, came forward from, from that. So. I thought I'd preface it at that point. And uh, thank you. I'll, I'll add to this because I think it's another, um, another thing I think it's just important for us all to keep in mind. Um, this was another example of multiple months of conversation and a request to bring some ideas forward. Um, because of the how we work, these ideas get posted to the board and to the public often at the same time. And so we have to contemplate what to do with these ideas 
And I think that this precipitated quite a bit of reaction that could have been resolved by a direct outreach or a phone call. And there were some assumptions about intent um, in, in um, uh, I think in the context of everything else that was going on. So I thought we had a good conversation about what we expected and the reason for bringing this forward. Um, and I think, um, you know, I appreciate that some folks had actually prepared some thoughtful recommendations about what we could um, incorporate here. I think we ended up with something that sets the expectation that we view our teachers as professionals. Um, we understand the physical complexities of their jobs. Um, and we would, I certainly would never have the expectation that somebody can't wear tennis shoes <laughs> um, in the classroom or that a PE teacher can't have the appropriate attire or that we would remove spirit days. Um, there was never discussion about that. Um, with that, I think is also, um, maybe for future discussion with the HR team. Um, unfortunately, that uh, the HR meeting, uh, Mr. Cuomo has some experience with this as well, is held in a, the satellite room. And there's a reason that it's held right before the board meeting, because we have contracts and things that are time sensitive that we need to move forward right away. If we had the HR meeting days before the full board meeting, we would have a gap and we wouldn't be able to do the business that we come together to do as a board. So that meeting is in the other room because it's held right before this meeting. Um, I support videotaping and um, transmitting our meetings, but it's not possible in that room right now given the technology. So we, um, on an evening like tonight, we have a, a full boardroom full of people. It's very difficult to have that meeting here. And also the HR meeting periodically has to go to closed session. And so if we're in the main boardroom and we go to closed session and then um, you know, we're, we're stalling the rest of the full board meeting. So I am, I'm probably not explaining this well, but um, it's an area where we might want to discuss, especially as we move into a new building as um, for our board meetings, that could we do something potentially different to make sure that those meetings are actually broadcast? Because one of my concerns is that the attendance of those meetings is very, very low. There's frequently one or two committee committee members, or I'm sorry, community members who may attend those meetings. And so um, unfortunately, I think maybe some of the comments that are made in that meeting are lost in translation and in communication out. And so that, in that intent isn't captured. Um, and I would very much like to go back to those conversations and you know, kind of reflect on what we did. So any thoughts about that from anybody else? Mr. Co Mr. Como. Um, just um, back in the olden days, um, we actually, for HR, we actually had committee time set up uh, a week ahead of time to cover items such as this one. And the meeting that preceded, immediately preceded the full board meeting was just for like the amendments. So I don't know if we want to go back to that or not. Um, I don't have any particular opinion that we should do that. Um, it's pretty rare that we have something like this come up right now. So, but that's, that was back in the olden days, so. Mm -hmm. Mr. Montillo. I, I am fine with the structure as to how it's scheduled. I think it makes sense. I think that would be fine as well. I've not set either way, but we do need to figure a way to broadcast this. It, it, one committee is not different than the other, um, and it, it's HR. It's our. It's extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think with the new re, uh, new location, we'll we'll figure it out. We have the money. We have to we have to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, I just want to make one comment on the policy. <coughs> excuse me, um, or the, rather the policies. Looking back at what was proposed versus what is proposed, I, I did have reservations, um, some of which Mr. Como read about how we would um, make some of the important changes in this policy um, that are that are I, that I feel are in the the second and third paragraph versus micromanaging what people where to work. My experience has been 
uh, modesty and professionalism. And I have not seen anything less from our staff or teachers anywhere that I have been in the district. Um, certainly the professionalism uh, will we'll make a great example for our students, which I think is part of this conversation. But I also felt it placed a unfair burden upon our um, female staff to have to uh, adhere to a dress code that would, would be difficult. And those are the concerns raised to me. And, uh, you know, that was why I had reservations on that policy. But I do like the changes that, that we've seen here. So that was my only comment. Thank you. Mr. Browski. Yes, I just need clarification on the second last paragraph. So um, if clothing fails to meet these standards as determined by the employee's supervisor, building administrator, or human resource staff, the employee, I, it, there's three things that follow. And my first reaction was maybe each one should be May. But so the employee may be asked not to wear the inappropriate item to work again, will be sent home without pay if applicable to change your clothing and or be subject to disciplinary action. So, I mean, is that the way the committee is recommending it? Like the second one will happen. They will be sent home or they may be sent home if a violation occurs. That's a good question. So, um, and this is Mr. Montijo's report, but the, the, the policy that's in front of you is what was approved by the committee, but we as a board have to take this up again. So if there's modifications, and, and I think you're making a really good point that there's some inconsistent language there. Yeah, I mean, it, it would seem to me that a better way to do it would be May, May, and May, but um, I don't know what, if there was rationale for, you know, suggesting this or if it was just an oversight. Are you making an amendment? Mr. Como? Yeah, I, <clears throat> when I read it, um, I did read it as may being before each of those. And I do think it would be more clear if we added it. Um, mm -hmm. And I would uh, make a motion to, uh, to do so, to add may uh, for the second item and or, and the third item. So, yep, so may be asked and then strike. Well, right now we have, we have 3216 in front of us or are we considering both right now? I, I would parallel it between mm -hmm. 3216 yeah. and 4216 then. Second. To, let me just clarify, um, not to get in the weeds, but we did not get a motion actually on the policy that came out of the committee. So the motion that you're making is... Premature. <laughs> did, Corey, you didn't, you didn't present it as... Oh, as a motion. a motion, we don't have a motion, right correct. So right. let me, I guess I'll just oh. make a recommendation of what I think it should be then, is that good? Right, so then whoever makes the motion could move to approve with those changes, or could, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Cole. I'll I know just what you're move gonna to do. approve 3216 and 4216 uh, as presented by the committee. Second. As presented by the committee. Yeah. Okay. Right. And then so this now would be the appropriate time if anybody wants to make amendments to the policy that they raise that. Sure. So I guess my amendment would be to say um, the employee may be asked, et cetera, may be sent home, et cetera, and or may be subject to disciplinary action. On both policies? Yes, on both. Because they're so written. You are making a motion for that amendment? Yes. I got a motion for that amendment. Seconded by Mr. McCaffrey. All right, so we would need to take a vote on the amendment. This is just for the modifications that Mr. Browski recommended. Okay. Okay. Corey Montillo. Aye. Mark Browski. Aye. Patrick McCaffrey. Aye. Karen, Ra oops, sorry. Ooh. Anthony Zenobia. Aye. Markel Moore. Aye. Carrie Kozlowski. Aye. Joseph Como. Aye. And Kelly Piasek. Aye. Passes 8-0. So we now have a motion um, moved and seconded to modify um, the active motion on the table. Any further questions or modifications? Okay. Sue, please take the roll call. Mark Borowski? Aye. Anthony Zenobia? Aye. Mark Kelmore? Aye. Carrie Kozlowski? Aye. Patrick McCaffrey? Aye. Joseph Como? Aye. Corey Montillo? Aye. Kelly Piasek? Aye. Passes 
thank you again for a productive conversation. All right. Next committee is the policy committee. Any updates, Mr. Montijo? No, Madam President. Policy committee does not meet monthly, um, but we and we do not have a policy uh, date or date set yet for the next policy meeting. I believe we await another Neola update. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on to the Finance and Facilities Committee. Yeah. Thank you, Madam President. <coughs> We do have one action item tonight and three information items. The action item is the 2023-2024 open enrollment projections. The committee reviewed the 2023-2024 open enrollment projections and forecasted available space in our programs. No action was taken at the committee level, but it is being brought forward to the board as an action item. I move to approve the 2023-2024 open enrollment space availability plan as presented. Second. Any questions or discussion? Mrs. Kozlowski. Uh, thanks. I just want to clarify with Dr. Cook and uh, Mr. Clark that we're still working on kind of the historical trends of enrollments in and out. So I, we are, yes, you'll get an update on what I started to discuss. I wish the technology would work because you could have seen the charts that we have. So yes, that'll be provided an update and then uh, uh, with Dr. Piasek's request to take a look at uh, in-district school choice. Uh, we're also working on those tables. Uh, we'll be discussing that next Tuesday at the Student Services Committee. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Okay, any further questions or comments? All right, Sue, you can take the vote. Carrie Kozlowski. Aye. Corey Montillo. Aye. Patrick McCaffrey. Aye. Joseph Como. Aye. Mark Borowski. Aye. Anthony Zenobia. Aye. Markel Moore. Aye. Kelly Piasek. Aye. Passes 8-0. Mr. Como. All right, thank you. Moving on to the information items. The first one is the 2021-2022 audit report. <clears throat> Each year, school districts are required to have a financial audit conducted upon the completion of their fiscal year and in June 30th. Wendy Unger, the CPA partner from Baker Tilly at US, USA LLP presented the 2021-2022 financial statements. Uh, there were no internal deficiencies to report to the board, nor were there any compliance issues uh, to report. The complete 2021-2022 audit results will be posted on the district website tomorrow morning uh, so members of the public can access the information. Moving on to the monthly budget report, uh, revenues and expenditures are within the budget limits for the general fund. The special education salary and benefits are starting to trend toward being over budget at uh, year end, particularly the aid and teacher salaries. Administration will continue to monitor the situation. The district is operating within our approved budget in all other funds. And then lastly, uh, our ESSER report. All of the ESSER funds have been assigned uh, teaching and learning will be uh, uh, will be bringing a few items for final approval in January or February. The administration will continue to keep the committee updated on the expenditure of these funds. And Madam President, this concludes my report. Thank you. All right, um, we do not have a need for executive session this evening, so we're. Um, at the point in our agenda where we could entertain any suggestions or recommendations for other business. All right, seeing none, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.